We ready to go, Maggie? Yes, you may proceed, Mr. Chair. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning to one and all. Uh, I call to order the February meeting of the University of Minnesota Board of Regents, and a very good morning to to one and all. Our very first item of business this morning is the formal introduction of the university's new chief auditor, Quinn Galswick. Vice Chair Swigum and President Gable, would you um, both of you please proceed to the podium for our introduction? I'm delighted to formally introduce Quinn Galswick as chief auditor. He is, as you all know, no stranger to the university, having earned a master of public policy from the Humphrey School and a bachelor's degree in business from the Carlson School before serving in the Office of Internal Audit for 14 years as an audit manager. Quinn previously gained experience in IT audit with Ernst & Young, recently performed a quality assessment review for Arizona State University on its internal audit function. He holds certifications in internal audit and information systems audit, and he also provides governance level audit perspective to the Metropolitan Council as a member of its audit committee. I want to add that I've been personally impressed by Quinn, both during the interview process last fall and in his initial days as chief auditor. And I look forward to uh, seeing working with Quinn and seeing him grow and, and lead in this important role. Uh, as I know we all do. Uh, President Gable, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board, honored guests and friends. I'm very pleased to take part in introducing Quinn Galswick as the new chief auditor. For the past 14 years, Quinn has made significant contributions to the success and excellence of the University of Minnesota's Office of Internal Audit, from managing teams and overseeing audit investigative work to exploring ways to further improve or grow the work of internal audit. Quinn's leadership capacity has become evident during his tenure at the University of Minnesota, and I know we all have every confidence that he will excel in this position. It's a pleasure to officially introduce Quinn to you in his new role as Chief Auditor. Congratulations. Uh, thank you, President Gable and Chair Powell for the introduction, and thank you to the Board of Regents honestly, from the bottom of my heart for this opportunity. There's not a lot of seven-year-olds that you'll ask what they want to be when they grow up. We'll tell you auditor. <laughs> and if I'm being honest, when I'm at a social gathering and somebody asks me what I do for a living, I normally say auditor, but I specialize in IT audit. And I know what you're thinking. He couldn't get any more interesting than when he said auditor. <laughs> then he put IT in front of it. But in all honesty, it's an incredible job. I get to come to work every day and be unabashedly pro-university, an organization I truly love and is in the business of improving the human condition. I get to do that with an incredible team of skilled and dedicated public servants who only have the goal of improving the operational efficiency and effectiveness of this organization. What job could be better than that? I know. Gail Klatt leaves very large shoes to fill. She served the university for 27 years and has built this function into a world-class operation. It's widely respected both within the university and throughout the industry and throughout uh, the internal audit industry. I know it will be difficult to fill those shoes, but I will promise everybody this. I will always put the interests of the university first and I will do my utmost to build and grow this industry leading function so that the people in this room can continue to look the students and the taxpayers of Minnesota in the eye and say, we are being good stewards of your dollars. We are operating effectively and we will leave this university and the world better than we found it. Thank you. Uh, 
that for a bit. All right. All right. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, welcome, Quinn. We really uh, do look forward to working with you. The next item of business before us this morning is approval of the minutes. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Uh, second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any uh, comments or discussion on the minutes? Hearing, uh, hearing none. All those in favor uh, uh, of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. All right, that motion uh, is approved. Next, we'll hear the report of the president, uh, President Gable. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Swigum, and members of the board. It has been a very busy but rewarding start to the spring semester at the University of Minnesota, exemplified by the robust nature of this month's board agenda, which is reflective of a lot of work and dedication <clears> happening <throat> across our university community and inspired by, measured by, and explained through our strategic plan. So this month, as we do throughout the year, I wanna note that we recognize and celebrate the black members of our university family, including exceptional accomplishments and contributions, as well as the considerable and ongoing struggles and how those have shaped, challenged, and strengthened our campus communities. I hope that you'll join us throughout February for our Black History Month events, including the next Voice, Art, and Community Series event featuring National Book Award winning poet Nikki Finney, which is scheduled for February 21st. With regard to the pandemic, members of the board, since I last updated you in December, the administration has continued to prioritize COVID-19 safety. And I'm pleased to report that still, there has not been a single cluster outbreak in a classroom on any of our five campuses since the pandemic began. Over recent weeks, we've updated our isolation and quarantine guidance to align with recommendations from the CDC. And we instituted a temporary proof of vaccine policy that went into effect from January 26th through February 9th at indoor events with attendance of 200 or more on any university campus. This temporary approach to public gathering spaces was another step at a critical moment that sought to reduce the stress on our overtaxed healthcare system. And as cases have come down, we have been able to lift it as has the mayors in Minneapolis and St. Paul. With regard to the legislative session, members of the board, last month we kicked off that session, including a recorded message from Chair Powell and me welcoming the legislature. And on January 20, uh, excuse me, January 18th, we hosted Governor Walls and members of his administration to the university's Institute of Child Development on the Twin Cities campus, where he announced his capital investment proposal, including $213.8 million for the university. Earlier this week, I testified before the Senate and House Higher Education Committees with Senior Vice President Franz and Dean Brian Bohr, and we look forward to continuing this important engagement and partnership with the state during this legislative session, and we will, of course, keep you posted on developments in that space. Members of the board, in November, we announced the launch of three competitive national searches for key leadership positions at the university, Vice President for Equity and Diversity, Vice President for Research, and the University of Minnesota Duluth Chancellor. The committees began meeting last month and listening sessions were conducted with key stakeholders to help inform the position profiles and search processes. I had the pleasure of visiting in Duluth last week where I, along with co-chair Senior Vice President Franz and UMD Associate Vice Chancellor Menzel hosted an open forum for all faculty and staff and met with community leaders to seek feedback about the search and the UMD 
take on that search. I should mention just as a quick aside, a shout out to UMD received some really nice, much deserved coverage in the Strib yesterday of how they are bolstering the local supply of social workers as a result of a federal grant, if you want a little more deep dive into what's going on in Duluth. But back to the searches, comprehensive recruiting efforts are taking place through March with confidential first round interviews planned in April, with the idea being that public interviews with the University of Community can take place before people start to uh, dissipate at the end of the semester and over the summer. With regard to public safety, members of the board, we continue to remain diligent in our public safety efforts, which are centered in the prioritization of our students, staff, and faculty safety, both on campus and in the neighborhoods surrounding our campus. As part of our layered and comprehensive approach, later in this meeting, you'll hear about the work of MSAFE. MSAFE, as a reminder, was our effort to begin the implementation process around Dr. Cedric Alexander's external review, along with our efforts around public safety and emergency response, which have been happening concurrently. So you will hear from the leadership of that effort who have been working incredibly hard with a large group of people, several of whom are in the room, to um, engage in the MSAFE effort. Earlier this morning, and in our work and commitment to develop and enhance our university history, and sustain our effort beyond the recently completed April 2019 board charge, the board's governance and policy committee approved a new board's namings policy, which was up for comprehensive review this year. The all university honors committee is establishing a working group to finalize the committee's naming criteria as well. And they'll also work out outstanding operational issues. We will hear back from the committee we expect by the end of the academic year and we'll provide ongoing reports and updates to the board accordingly. Members of the board, later in this meeting, you will take action on the system accountability report, which represents the first year of implementation for MPAC 2025. So I will defer details on that for that presentation. But also part of MPAC 2025, we have made presentations to you about PEAK, which is our administrative overhead and operational efficiency review. You heard a formal update at the December meeting, and now we are in phase one of the PEAK project. Over recent weeks, we held a peak kickoff for functional working teams who will, over the course of the spring, develop and refine recommendations for each function, which include finance, IT, procurement, marketing and comms, and human resources. We are on schedule and remain on track for September to share a proposal for the next phase of the project. Some events that I want to share with you, members of the board, since the October meeting, I've had the opportunity to engage our community in some important and meaningful ways that I'd like to share. We participated in the university's 41st annual Martin Luther King Jr. Tribute Concert. We attended the ROTC Veteran Service Lunch. I worked with and had the opportunity to present to the UMN Women Coaches and Leadership Gathering. We welcomed First Lady Jill Biden and Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra to a child development event. We've met with the TC deans, the system council, the cabinet, and of course, EMPC continues to meet in support of the COVID management process at the university across the system. We've had our meetings with FCC, the foundation, Embold leadership through Greater MSP, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, the Next Gen Ag focus group as that program is being developed and worked actively across many aspects of the institution in supporting Greater MSP's Build Back Better application. I recently joined state and national leaders along with many of my peers in the intercollegiate athletics department at the NCAA convention in Indianapolis and in board service with the Big Ten, the AAU, the Fulbright Committee, the Minnesota Business Partnership, and began my new role as the incoming commissioner on APLU's Economic Development and Community Engagement Committee. It's been a very busy, active start to the spring semester, I know, for all of us, and we're very grateful for all the opportunities we've had to engage across the university community and beyond over recent weeks. So members of the board, I'd like to close my report as has become a happy practice with a video shout out on all the things that make us UMN proud.
much happened. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes my report. Thank you, President Gable. <laughs> Many good things happening. Turning to my report, I'd like to once again highlight the significant uh, strategy and governance work being advanced this month. Uh, yesterday, uh, at the Mission Fulfillment Committee, we discussed the exciting and groundbreaking FARM initiative. Not only does FARM, in both its planned results and its partnership with Minnesota State, deliver against an impact 2025 goal it also delivers on the long held covenant between the university and the people of Minnesota that is part and parcel of our land grant mission. In the Finance and Operations Committee, we were reminded once again of the ongoing and sobering impacts of the pandemic on our institution. We discussed concrete steps being taken to sharpen our focus on performance management, which is more critically important than ever in the face of sweeping and unpredictable changes in our nation's workforce and economy. And the committee took action to issue a century bond, which reflects innovative financing to support long-term strategic objectives. The audit and compliance committee had a wide ranging discussion on the university's robust infrastructure to prevent and address academic and research misconduct. Our good news in this space is no accident. It's the result of diligence and hard work. And I share my gratitude. This morning, the Governance and Policy Committee took action on an updated and significantly more strategic board policy on namings and renamings. And this action, as we've just heard, is the result of many months of effort, care, and creativity by President Gable and this board as she navigated this complex matter across the university's shared governance structure. And we thank her for achieving a new policy in this space that is so important to the university community. Finally, I'll note that later this morning, we'll hear an update on the East Gateway project. And now I want to thank uh, personally, Tom Holtz, Russ Nelson, and Mo Sherman, who serve as our appointees to the East Gateway Project Committee and who are with us today. Uh, these folks are deep experts, deeply experienced in development, and their continued involvement and guidance on behalf of the university are really important to the project's success. And show I, so I share my appreciation to the three of you uh, uh, this morning. So with that, I conclude my report and we'll turn to the next agenda item. Item five is receive and file reports. This month, we have the semi-annual uh, summary of expenditures uh, and a gifts report. Next, we will consider the consent report. Uh, is there a motion to approve the consent report? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any dis uh, discussions or comments on the consent report? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor, 
uh, of approving this consent report, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. All right, that motion is approved. Our next item is action on the 2021 University Performance and Accountability Report. There have been no substantive changes to the report since our review in December. However, Provost Croson has an update on an adjustment to one of the metrics since our review. So uh, Provost Croson, over to you. Thank you, Chair Powell, uh, members of the board. Uh, we seek your approval of the 2021 University Performance and Accountability Report, which we presented and reviewed with you in a draft version at your December meeting. Since that time, final proofreading has resulted in small corrections and adjustments. In addition, a few of the data points from the dashboard and progress card that were not yet available in December have been finalized. Strategic plans are living documents that we continue to refine as we meet our goals and determine how best to measure those areas that we seek to improve. One refinement we made is in an area that I know is of great importance to you, administrative costs. The previous version of our plan had administrative costs reducing year over year. As we work to determine the baseline for the administrative cost measure, we felt it was important to set a numerical goal, or in this case, a range, that's consistent with what many nonprofits or charitable organizations consider to be an aspirational benchmark. We seek to ensure that our administrative costs support our interconnected goals of administrative efficiency and providing appropriate levels of support for our mission. Our overall goal remains to gain efficiencies and to direct both financial and human resources to mission activities, concentrating our investment in research, education, and outreach. I wanna repeat my thanks and acknowledgement to the multiple units that work together to produce this document, especially colleagues in university relations, the Office of Institutional Analysis, and the presidents and the provost's offices. Chair Powell, members of the board, President Gable and I recommend the 2021 University Performance and Accountability Report for your approval. All right. This concludes. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost Croson. Uh, is there a motion to approve the 2021 University Performance and Accountability Report? So moved. Second. Uh, is, there, is there a second? Second. Second, thank you. Uh, moved and seconded. Any uh, questions, comments, or points to discuss? I, I can't see any from my end. Uh, Mr. Steves, do you see any hands raised? Mr. Chair, there are no, uh, there's no one on the speaker's list. All right. With no uh, questions or comments, let's, let's vote. All those in favor of the 2021 Performance and Accountability Report, please say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed, say no. All right, that motion is approved. We'll move now to our next item, which is before us for both review and action. This is a resolution related to the repatriation of the Mimbres objects. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? Second. And moved and seconded. It has been moved and seconded. President Gable, would you like to make any comments? Yes, thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spingham, and members of the board. So uh, beginning in August 2020, and as part of our commitment through MPAC 2025, the university began a formal and historic consultation with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, which we often refer to as MIAC. And I want to acknowledge uh, that the University of Minnesota is built within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. The item before you is an important step in strengthening this commitment and our important and shared partnership with Minnesota's 11 sovereign nations, as they have been strong advocates for the repatriation of the Mimbres objects associated with the ancestral remains as sought by the tribal nations of the Southwest. 
members of the board before turning it over to Executive Vice President and Provost Rachel Croson and to University NAGPRA Advisory Committee Chair and former Provost Karen Hansen, who will provide a brief summary of the resolution that comes before the board. I wanna thank the members of the advisory committee for their time, diligence and commitment to serving the University of Minnesota and this important chapter in our history. So with this appreciation and acknowledgement for the weight and importance of this moment, I turn the presentation over to Provost Croson with your permission, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Thank you, President Gable, and uh, welcome back, President Croson. And also, uh, good to see you, uh, Provost, I guess, Provost Emeritus Hansen. Great to see you. Thank you, uh, President Gable, Chair Powell, members of the board. I want to thank the members of the NAGPRA Advisory Committee, who you see on your screen, and especially their chair, former Provost Karen Hansen for the group's extensive and thorough work that has led to the resolution before you today. I'd also like to express my deepest appreciation to the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, as well as the many other subject matter experts consulted for their counsel to the committee throughout this process. I especially appreciate the anthropological, curatorial, and scientific expertise that all these individuals brought to this topic. We value all of these parties' insights into the complicated history of the members' artifacts and of the university itself. We take very seriously our commitment to properly and promptly address that history and the university's custody of these artifacts. <laughs> Chair Powell, Dr. Hansen will provide a brief summary of the resolution. Okay. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, on behalf of the advisory committee, uh, I want to express my gratitude as well for the opportunity to bring this resolution to the board. I'm grateful, um, on, and as is the whole committee, for the support of President Gable and Provost Croson for the work of the committee, as well as the support and help from a number of other university <coughs> offices, including the Office of Equity and Diversity, especially Vice President Michael Goh and Director of Tribal Relations, Tad Johnson, Karen Diver, Senior Advisor to the President for Native American Affairs, Wiseman Art Museum, especially Associate and now Acting Registrar Rosa Corral, the Anthropology Department, especially Matt Edling, the Lab and Collections Manager at the, uh, in Anthropology, and many others. As you can see from the, the slide, uh, the members of the Advisory Committee were drawn from a range of departments and schools with a variety of relevant disciplinary lenses, anthropology, American studies, Chicano and Latino studies, architecture and historic preservation and heritage studies, art history, library and information sciences, law, history, and American Indian studies. And they all approach this task with seriousness and thoughtful dedication. I must, however, single out for special thanks, Professor Kat Hayes from Anthropology and American Indian Studies, whose dedication to the work of the committee, in fact, extends to a time before the formation of the committee, not only through her work with MIAC and her direct engagement with a number of tribal historic preservation officers, but also through her alerting the central administration, including me in 2019 before I retired when I was still serving as provost of the need to complete cataloging of the members materials transferred from anthropology to the Wiseman Art Museum and right up to today as she brought her anthropological expertise to this work along with an enormous investment of time and careful scholarship. All of us on the committee, all of us who are aware of her work in this arena share that sense of gratitude. This has been a long process and a process made more difficult over the course of the advisory committee's existence by the pandemic. Since the president's October 2020 charge to the committee, work that had already begun to inventory the materials at the museum had to be halted for some time because of COVID and, and a facility shutdown of the museum building for repairs. Those things happened at separate times. Um, and there were also some personnel changes, both at WAM and in the anthropology doctoral student workers. It was in addition sometimes difficult to connect with relevant tribal historic preservation officers because of closed offices and severe pandemic stresses some of the tribes were experiencing. 
But this advisory committee was able to build on some of the work done prior to the pandemic by both MIAC and by the uh, University of Minnesota Anthropology Department and to continue on its own through phone calls and Zoom. So throughout this time, consultations have been sought with 28 tribes. Requests for consultations were guided by the president's charge to consult with all tribal nations that are or are likely to be culturally affiliated with the Mimbres objects or lineal, lineally descended from the Mimbres. This list of 28 tribes constitutes a wide net, but one reasonably constructed by geographical and anthropological considerations. And it's important to note that the consultation process can be expected to continue even after the submission and publication of the inventory of Mimbrae's materials currently in the care of the university. Let me say just a word about the inventory. This was a double-sided process involving, on the one hand, a physical inventory of objects and human remains, and secondly, a provision of provenience information, if that was available, for everything in the physical inventory. This was a cooperative effort overseen by uh, on the first side, the, the WAM registrar, along with project interns, who made photographs, took measurements, uh, noted material type, and so on. And the anthropology department, which had transcribed and digitized all the historic field records of the materials excavated by the University of Minnesota anthropologists, and, uh, Albert Jenks and Lloyd Wilford and their students and workers, during a series of expeditions to New Mexico that took place from 1928 to 1931. And to get a sense of the scale of this work, um, there, were roughly, there are roughly 1,300 items that will be uh, included in the inventory notice, not counting shirred lots and animal bones. The associate registrar, uh, registrar at WAM tells me that um, over 4,000 items have now been sorted through. Um, mostly at WAM. The process of reconciliation of the uh, field notes and the objects has also during this time been supplemented by other investigative work undertaken by anthropology. Records indicate some of the excavated materials were in that past era sent to other institutions, gifted or traded to individuals or other departments or museums. There has been on the part of our current anthropology department a concerted effort to track down those materials. And as they've been found, there's been discussion of bringing the materials back together to ease the processes of repatriation. Discussion of how such processes of coordination might proceed was beyond the remit of this advisory committee. But assuming the resolution related to repatriation of members objects is endorsed by you today, information on regathering scattered funerary objects could be helpful to the president as she guides the university to fulfillment of its obligations under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. The president's charge to the committee asked that we assess the cultural affiliation of any tribal nation with the membrane's materials, relying on the tribal consultation process, the opinions of outside experts and consultants, and the research and expertise of the particular committee members who possessed such expertise. That did not include me, but you will notice that most <laughs> of the people come from fields where that's relevant. Uh, NAGPRA notes that the determination of cultural affiliation may involve evidence from geographical, kinship, biological, archeological, anthropological, linguistic, folkloric, oral traditional, historical, or other relevant information or expert opinion. No particular type of evidence is weighed more heavily than another. And the standard for inclusion of a tribal nation as culturally affiliated is a preponderance of the evidence. In arriving at its recommendations to the provost and president, the committee did consult with museum curators, directors, and other experts, including government officials, and also relied on published and peer-reviewed research, anthropological research on oral traditions of the Southwestern tribes, geographical associations, archeological evidence and interpretation, indirect evidence from historical linguistics and evident patterns of language spread, 
and also, very importantly, on tribal consultations. The 28 tribes contacted for direct consultation were determined on the basis of the scholarly evidence in the categories I just noted. We also want to note that a pattern emerged of Western Pueblo tribes, the Hopi, Zuni, Akoma, and Laguna, expressing the strongest sense of cultural affiliation. And the committee heard an affirmation by those tribes and by others more distantly related of a willingness to collaborate and coordinate with one another on repatriation. Additional discussions with these tribes and the others can be completed after the submission of the notice of inventory completion. The advisory committee thus recommended to the president and provost an inclusive cultural affiliation list based on the scholarly and consultative information included in the committee report and excluding only those tribal nations that specifically declined to be included. The advisory committee recommended to the president and provost that the university move with some alacrity to file a notice of inventory completion and then proceed with the next steps of repatriation. That's the background to the resolution before you. So uh, I'm happy to take questions about the process and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, Provost uh, Croson, do you have any additional comments before I open it up to discussion? I, I just want to extend again my sincere thanks to former Provost Hansen for guiding the university through this very challenging uh, process. Yes, and I, I know that we all, we all echo those thanks, um, former Provost Hansen, for the very, very hard and the very, very careful uh, and diligent work uh, of, of the committee. Um, let's open it up to, uh, to discussion. Uh, uh, Mr. Steves, you, if you'll help me if anyone wants to, uh, has questions or wants to comment. Uh, we have Regent McMillan. All right, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell, and uh, thank you, Provost Croson. Um, two comments, one, the first and most important, uh, I'm fully supportive of Moving forward here, I think the legal and moral obligation is clear, and uh, this is the right thing to do. So, um, secondly, Provost Emeritus, or let's see, retired Provost Hansen, it is uh, amazingly good to see you before us again. And uh, there's few people in in my history here over a decade now that I have more confidence in handling complex and challenging topics and uh, bringing things to resolution as skillfully and carefully and as consultatively. I don't think that's a word, but uh, you are very good at it. And uh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your commitment and effort to, uh, to do this. Thank you, uh, thank you, Regent McMillan. Uh, Mr. Steves, uh, anyone else? Uh, Regent Rocha is on the list. Regent Rocha, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is um, you know, really a remarkable kind of uh, period for the university. And, and, and again, going to the, you know, the evolution of our thinking about various uh, things in terms of the relationships with uh, indigenous peoples. And, and I'm, I'm excited to see that it's being handled so well, so thoughtfully. One question that arose, and I may have missed it, it may have been in the material someplace, but I may have missed it. But um, as we you know, you saw through some of the dialogue that um, the antiquity of some of the objects, it, it's it, the, the remoteness of time, um, you know, there's a bit of a challenge in really being able to specifically identify, you've got a preponderance standard for who would have a claim to the materials. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, as we go forward, because obviously we're in this policy, or this uh, resolution rather, you know, grants all authority in the president to, to take the, an action in, in making a delivery of the objects. Um, and as an aside, one would hope that perhaps we could, if there still is a basis to continue to use the, the objects for research that it could be done collaboratively with the then owners, um, if that were something to, to happen going forward. But is there a liability, if I don't know if the general counsel can speak to it, where if, if we do, when, if and when we do decide to make a, a, a delivery of the objects um, based on, on this authority, uh, if, if another tribe, another entity were to, to lay claim or, or seek um, 
possession or claim ownership, does does there is there a, a, a liability challenge for the university that we need to be aware of in, in with respect to that? And it's you know just kind of trying to think as broadly as possible to ensure that we're getting it right and uh, and what the what the challenges are um, if we have competing claims. Thank you, uh, thank you, Regent Rocha. I, I think I'm going to ask uh, former Provost Hansen if she uh, is in a position to comment at all on the question, and, and then we can turn it over to the General Counsel. Well, uh, one thing. Th thank you, Chair Powell and uh, Regent Rocha. One thing that um, is important about the process is that the first step is the filing of this notice of the inventory, which then. Uh, invites anyone else who might have uh, any other tribe or nation that might um, uh, want to assert a claim the opportunity to do that. So they're, uh, they're built into the processes for NAGLA is a, is a, um, uh, an, a further check that um, uh, is likely to um, uh, make less, well, likely to forestall that that um, scenario. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, former provost, uh, uh, general counsel. Do you want to comment on uh, Regent Rocha's uh, question? Thank you, Chair Powell, um, Regent Rocha. Um, Chair Hansen touched on, um, I think the um, the process that. Um, helps the university work through whatever its legal responsibilities are here. There's certainly a legal framework we need to follow and potential liabilities attached to that. Um, but the process that NAGPRA um, calls for the university to follow, including kind of filing the notices with the federal government, having the consultations we're, we're embarking upon and giving people notice allows people the opportunity to come forward and have those potentially competing claims sorted out. If it arises that there is a conflict between claimants, um, I would anticipate that we will be able to um, develop a legally appropriate way to sort those out and more likely to have um, you know, a third party, whether it be the federal government or a federal court, um, sort out competing claims before we need to act. But I think given the work of the committee and the types of consultations they're undertaking, I'm optimistic that the groundwork has been laid for repatriations in what would be in a respectful and honorable manner. Um, and um, by all accounts, even though I haven't been directly connected with the committee work, um, those consultations have and it resulted in a lot of um, very healthy and sort of, if I might say, historic um, cooperation in terms of trying to make sure the university can fulfill what I think primarily here are our responsibilities as a matter of our values as a land grant institution, um, let alone our legal responsibilities. So um, yes, there are, you know, uh, potential legal worries that lurk, but as I say, um, I'm, I think the process will, on, its, uh, on the natural, will um, cure those concerns. Thank you, uh, General mm -hmm. Counsel. Uh, Regent Rocha, did that, uh, did that get at it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, uh, General Counsel Peterson and, and uh, Provost Hansen uh, for that answer. I, it just feels, this thing just feels right. It feels like it's the, the right thing to do. It feels like the right time. And, and I really appreciate all the work that the, this group has done and, and uh, look forward to a successful process. Thank you. Good. Uh, uh, Mr. Steves, others who want to, with questions or comments? Mr. Chair, I have no one else on the speakers list. All right, there being uh, no additional questions uh, or comments, uh, let's vote. Uh, all those in favor of the, of the, of the resolution, please, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> All right. That motion is approved. Before turning to our next item, uh, I would like to make a statement regarding uh, the resolution that we've just approved. <clears throat> Today's repatriation determination 
is another milestone for our institution and our tribal partners. And it is driven by our values rather than just by the law. This is an opportunity to reaffirm the mission of the University of Minnesota. While the law maps out the decisions to be made, it is the moral and ethical calling of our land grant university that inspires and guides us, demanding that we act justly by repatriating that which was never ours. We cannot undo our past. We can accept responsibility for it. And that means more than acknowledgments and apologies. Today, the university is exhibiting the values of what it means to be a land grant institution by authorizing the repatriation of the Mimbres objects to their rightful home with their native peoples. We express our regret that it was not done sooner. <coughs> with the same humility, we hope today's university decision will contribute to how we as a society reckon with our past. We cannot undo history or fully right our wrongs, but we can learn from each other as to how to build a better future. That's a responsibility we all share. This journey towards repatriation finds the university owing a debt of gratitude to many, foremost to the tribal nations of the Southwest who have long called for justice and offered us their counsel, especially the nations of the Pueblo, Hopi, and Zuni. Also to the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council and its associated 11 tribal nations who have cared for Mimbra's ancestral remains and tirelessly advocated for repatriation. We now call upon President Gable, who has the board's respect for her leadership in these matters of tribal relations to complete what is required to work with the affiliated tribal nations to repatriate the ancestral remains and associated artifacts in a manner respectful and appropriate to their noble and longstanding traditions. Thank you. And thank you again, uh, uh, former Provost Hansen, uh, for your leadership here. We're very, very, very grateful and grateful that it was in your good hands. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll now move to our next discussion items. Next on the agenda is uh, our second conversation on the university's health sciences strategy, which is a key priority for the board. Today, we'll focus specifically on education across the health sciences. We're joined by Jacob Toller, Dean of the Medical School and Vice President for Clinical Affairs, and by Dr. Brian Sick, Interim Associate Vice President in the Office of Academic Health Sciences. And so President Gable, please, if you will uh, lead us off. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spigum, and members of the board. So the health sciences at the University of Minnesota is a world-class strength. And every day we lean into our legacy of delivery through learning, discovery, and service. As part of our overall health sciences strategy, we shared with you at the October meeting our work to drive innovation for next gen health, including a tour of our state of the art health sciences education center where you saw firsthand our work to shape the future of healthcare in our classrooms, in our sim labs, and with immersive training. Built on this engagement today, this presentation will take a deeper dive into our overall health sciences strategy, and in particular, our work to train the next generation of healthcare workers to meet Minnesota's evolving workforce needs. The presentation will highlight how our health sciences strategy is aligned to specific goals and outcomes in Impact 2025, including our work to increase collaboration to serve as a model in health education, clinical training, and new models of care. The presentation will also highlight how the pandemic has evolved our teaching model and has led to the creation of new and transformative workforce innovations and pipelines such as NextGen Med. We're very proud of all this and the countless other ways our health sciences strategy aims to continuously improve and innovate, particularly in how we think and engage from the classroom, in research, and in communities around the world and right here at home. Mr. Chair, Vice President for Clinical Affairs and Dean of the Medical School, Jacob Tolar, is here to share with you this important update. And with your permission, I'd like to turn it over to him. Absolutely. Thank you, President Gable. And as ever, uh, Dean Tolar, great to see you. And uh, we look forward to your comments. Chair Powell, Vice Chair Swigum, Madam President, members of the board, thank you very much for having us today again. And this time speaking about 
the key fundamental topic, which is the health science education. I'm delighted that I'm joined here today by Dr. Brian Sick, whom I have known for decades now. He is the division director of general internal medicine in medical school. He is interim AVP for health science education. He is outstanding physician, and he's a national and international expert in interprofessional education. I'm also glad that his tie is different than mine because my other region's tie is exactly <laughs> the same one as this one. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are delighted to be here for several reasons. The first one, I'm, I'm disproportionately proud of our students, our trainees, our fellows, our residents, you know, in all parts of the university, not just the health sciences, because health matters to everyone. I'm disproportionately proud of our teams, the way how we connect network across the university. And I'm disproportionately proud that we are here as the land grant university to serve the state in a time of incredible challenge, which is the challenge of workforce. It doesn't actually matter where you live in the state of Minnesota, because the greater Minnesota, rural Minnesota, is a part of the rural America. About 12 million Americans live in the rural areas, and 80%, 80% of rural America is medically underserved. There will be a shortage of about 80,000 physicians over the last 10 years in the rural uh, spaces. And the, it's not just the absolute number, it's actually the delta as well, because about 23 to 25% decrease will accelerate across this decade. So this is serious. This is not just COVID, even though it has been put in a sharp focus by COVID, but this is a daily challenge of getting an access for somebody who has a baby in the North Minnesota and there's no NICU and no high risk pregnancy care north of Duluth. Uh, it's somebody who has a stroke, you know, on the, on the, on the Western borders of our state that may not be able to get quickly enough for the thrombolectomy. It's somebody who may not be in the care of a physician that has been kept on the, 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 the higher level of training so that she or he can in fact deliver the care that we seek. I wanna be clear, this is not just the, as many times this is, this is not just the problem. It's actually an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity for us as a university to deliver care in ways that has never been done before using telemedicine, telehealth, using digital health, using a number of things that I have presented to this August board before, how farming and health is connected in the state and how can one be leveraged with each other. So this is a way, and the third component I should mention is, which is obvious, that the population in the United States is aging. So ability to deliver age appropriate comprehensive care is a part of the whole equation of the of the workforce this is a part of the uh, of the of the impact and uh, under the phenomenal leadership of president gable we are able to really deliver on this not just talk not just not just getting a couple of white papers couple of slide decks and and so forth but we are really able to deliver on the new modes of delivery on on the fact that the success of our students and trainees is a success for the university and is a success for the state. There's no, it's not just continuum, it's really the same thing. You cannot fracture this in any way. On the plan level, it's a part of the mentor sections. The, the, the bottom line, the common denominator of the mentor section, as I understand them, is collaboration. We work with each other because knowledge and time happens to be a networked good. It matters a great deal if you are spending the time alone or with somebody, or if you are educated alone or among the people. The more, it's like iPhones, right? You know, iPhone makes a sense to have because other people have it. It's the same thing. The more people we can integrate into the network of education, the better, the higher quality, the higher impact the education education will be. So the, the, the ability of the, of the mentor sections to really deploy across all of these uh, new models of care and new ways of clinical training makes the, 
the, the collaborations, not just, not just high quality, but also deep, you know, wide as Mississippi, but really deep, you know, as well, because the higher quality of the education will translate into better clinical training. And as many things in life, this is not a moment. This is not a snapshot in time. The, the, the education that we provide, the learning that we provide is a continuum. It's a, it's a, it's a step after step. It's a, it's, a, it's, it's a way, it's a journey in a way. And this, how we look at this, we start with the pipeline programs. We go to the undergraduate, we go to the graduate, then to the professional. And as I've said before, a physician that has not led 100 books is dangerous, you know, and, and dent is the same thing. You have to continue studying and we all have our boards every five or seven years to repeat. So we are not resting or anything, but, but this is a lifelong quest and it's amazingly helped by the university. Good. So I'll turn now to my friend and colleague, Dr. Sig, that he will, that brings you across the different stops in that journey, Dr. Sig. Very good. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Sfigum, uh, members of the board and Madam President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to talk to you about uh, our health science education. So the, the COVID pandemic, of course, brought some substantial educational challenges, uh, but uh, it was paired with some tremendous opportunities to evolve our teaching model obviously not unique to students and teachers all over the world. We had a chance to, uh, we had to pivot our educational model very quickly to a hybrid or online format. However, our health science students had a very unique challenge. They had to learn, uh, they learn how to take care of patients by taking care of patients. And that was a process that was disrupted by the COVID pandemic. Uh, so first of all, we train our students in simulations before we have them see real patients. And simulations are typically done in person. So we had to quickly pivot to virtual simulations, which is a new model of simulation for us. Uh, but within, in, with partnership with our M simulation under the leadership of Lou Clark, uh, we were able to quickly pivot and do virtual simulations. Uh, the, the simulation center also helped us with our, uh, the new education we had to provide to our students on how to accurately and safely use all of the new personal protective equipment that was required to take care of our COVID patients. And then of course, taking care of patients had to change very rapidly. So I, I see patients over in the clinics and surgery center. I'm an internal medicine and pediatric physician. And I overnight essentially had to learn how to care for patients using telehealth. And I had to quickly teach the medical student and the nurse practitioner student that I work with each time I'm in clinic, how to use telehealth. Obviously that was a substantial challenge, but it's a huge opportunity for our students who now are going into the world knowing how to use telehealth. <coughs> So I've, I've been in interprofessional education for the last 15 years, been a leader in interprofessional education. And I know that taking care of patients and teams is the safest, highest quality, and uh, for our teams helps to reduce burnout. Therefore, it's essential that our students learn how to take care of uh, patients in teams from the beginning. So for example, starting first year, first semester, 1,300 students from 17 professions across three campuses, Twin Cities, Rochester, and Duluth, are oriented to team-based care right off the bat. That, that interprofessional team curriculum is then threaded throughout their education from their first year to the last year and helps them uh, graduate with skills and collaboration and team-based team care uh, so they're ready to take care of the patients of Minnesota and beyond. So the first step in that learning continuum that we talked about uh, is our pipeline programs. So to create a healthcare workforce for Minnesota, we need to recruit and prepare health professionals who are representative of Minnesotans. Therefore, we look to encourage and foster interest starting in high school or earlier. So for example, on our Duluth campus, the College of Pharmacy works with eight to 12 year olds 
and a week-long Kids Rock summer camp to give them hands-on experiences. That camp is a, is a program for high school students delivered by College of Veterinary Medicine students to teach them about veterinary medicine using fun, interactive activities. You see a number of other programs listed on the side there. One I'll call out is the Ladder. Ladder is a program started through our, our Broadway Family Medicine Clinic in North Minneapolis. And this provides a tiered mentorship from fourth grade to seasoned healthcare professional, where each rung of the ladder mentors the rung below and is mentored by the rung above. And the, they have a motto, which I really like, which is lift as you climb, build as you grow. So as we move on along the continuum to our undergraduates, we have programs that streamline the process from undergraduate degree to a health profession degree, such as our BAMD joint admission, our BSN program for St. Paul College transfer option, our four plus one master's in environmental health, vet lead, which partners with students from Florida A&M and Alabama A&M University. And these streamlined processes are done by fostering internal collegiate connections and forming key external partnerships. Some programs like the Medical Lab Science Pathways Program uh, Scholarship provides financial aid to those from backgrounds that are underrepresented in, in healthcare. The Pre-Health Student Resource Center at the University of Minnesota offers undergraduates an orientation to all of the health professions. So they choose the one that's best for them and helps them in their path all the way from exploration to application to a health profession. I believe you may have heard about Next Gen Med before, um, but as a reminder, this is a program that provides students from underrepresented in medicine populations, such as first generation, students of color, Pell eligible students with a streamlined two and a half year curriculum, including summers, to graduate with a Bachelor of Science in Health Sciences at our Rochester campus, cutting a year and a half off of a traditional four year degree. The goal is to increase affordability and access to health professions training and increase diversity in our health science programs. This is done in partnership with Mayo Clinic who provides mentors and research opportunities with Google Cloud and MedTech organizations in Discovery Square in Rochester. Then we move on along the continuum to our graduates. And so our programs have been growing and in ways that are important to our heritage in Minnesota, such as the pathway that's been created by our School of Nursing in Bemidji State to increase the number of Native Americans earning a PhD in nursing. We've also grown our educational program we provide our health profession students with an exceptional nation leading interprofessional education, which has grown to serve two and a half times the students it did even just 10 years ago. We have assets such as the National Center for Interprofessional Practice and Education, which is, has its 10 year anniversary here at the university. And of course the new Health Science Education Center, which you saw back in October with its state of the art active learning classrooms, simulations and library services. We have students who are in the community teacher program, which uh, puts students in groups of three into the community, learning from community members what it's like to live with a chronic illness. Our students participate in the world's first interprofessional education escape room, uh, which if any of you have done a popular escape room in the community, it's a lot of fun for our students. It was created here at the university and we were thrilled that uh, President Gable participated in one back in 2019. And then for those students who go beyond the core curriculum, the IP scholars and interns take extra work with projects to improve the curriculum or in partnership with our communities across the state, including at the Morris campus with the Morris Challenge, where an interprofessional team of students interviews community members to identify and implement solutions for rural challenges. Turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Fick, uh, Chair Powell, uh, members of the board. Uh, the clinical training is uh, different than any other training that I know. It has a huge advantage of being able to span all the strength and all the different mental muscles of the university from arts and humanities to sciences. But one thing that I have seen as much as I 
love digital health and telehealth and everything that is instrumental and on, on our iPhones, it's an apprenticeship. To be a good doctor, you have to see it done well. I know it from the operating room. I know it from the clinic. You have to see a master doing this. Our family medicine practitioners, for example, in rural Minnesota, for me, are examples of that, that you can actually show people that you are training how medicine needs to be delivered. Because not, uh, not to fall into the trap of the fact that we have everything, you know, that we can Google today, that we can everything, you know, we can print out and, you know, somehow look at it. Ultimately, our patients want us to be present. Our patients want us to examine them with our hands. Our patients want to be around us and our teams. So, so there is no subtraction from that complexity of this kind of apprenticeship, of this kind of education. When I look at the ability to deliver health sciences education that spans dentistry, vet medicine, uh, school of public health, nursing, uh, pharmacy and medicine, of course, but it also goes to the spheres of allied health and many, many other layers of the, uh, of the whole equation. When I look at that workforce and I look at last two years, I would say that the, what others called allosteric load has happened to us in spades. Allosteric load basically means that you have a chronic stress of some sorts, and then on top of it, an event happens that makes it even more difficult. And what we have ended up in a way is a, uh, almost a gig economy. You know, my nurse travelers, you know, are better off financially than my nurses that are loyal to M Health Fairview or other hospitals that I serve. And we really need to change that mindset and build in the loyalty and the integrity and that momentum, that stickiness that people stay you know, with you because they somehow they do something, they make contribution that, that make their life meaningful. And there's no better way to do this than at the university and academic medicine. When I say academic medicine, I'm not looking just at the pathobiology, the scientific part of it. It's really important. But each one of us that has ever been sick or had a loved one that was sick knows that there's a big difference between understanding what's wrong and the experience of illness. And that experience of illness is where the medicine and other health sciences are so important in taking care of our, of our patients. The academic medicine also means in current state, business of medicine. You know, I learned in the last five years more about business of healthcare than I, than I thought I might, uh, but, but it's, it's actually fun. You know, it's actually good stuff to know. And there's a different kind of leadership in academia that you can bring as a medical professional, as a healthcare professional outside to the service of people who live in the state. This is also one part of that continuum that I described to you at the beginning where the education never stops. You know, the, the continuous professional education, as we call it, is really deployed to all healthcare systems in the state. It's, it's a science of sorts. We have funded, medical school had, uh, what we call learning health system science. We look at Mayo Clinic, we look at other places in, on the coast at the, um, in New York, for example, for, for, for examples. And uh, we are looking at how to, domesticate the enormous amount of data, which is a both a benefit and a curse, if you think about this, and put it in the service of the patients, of the decision-making of their clinicians, and of the business of the care. So you can and will end up, as I will, I hope, you know, in this deployment of the care in the digital sense, not only at the precision medicine or high definition medicine, it's much more accurate now with all the omics, you know, genomics, phenomics, and so forth. It's also better medicine because it's tailored to the individual and it's brought, you know, on the, on the background of everybody else, not just locally, integrated in the local, but also nationally, internationally. And this will transform with the artificial intelligence and machine, machine learning models and decision-making into what I would call a real-time, always-on primary care. That means that the Fitbit or ambient intelligence in the room of your mother will feed that information to the clinician and the team around that, uh, the, the clinical team, and then make the decisions that are accurate, much more accurate, much more timely, and much more impactful than we are able to do today. 
I said collaboration. The partnership is the backbone of everything that we do. We never stand still. And you can look at the number of examples. Dr. Uh, Delaney, Dean Delaney from nursing, you know, her St. Cloud State partnership. You look at Dean Molgard from veterinary medicine, the veterinary nurses. You look at Dean Beebe with the learning health system. You can look at Dean Mace with uh, his ability, what we call ECHO project. It's a, it's a tele dentistry, if you will. Uh, and uh, you can look at Dean Wellich from uh, pharmacy at her pharmacy cooperation groups and so forth. So this is all sort of tied in together. And these deans are working extra hard and I'm grateful to uh, Provost Cross and to, uh, to uh, convene with me the, the group of health science deans so that we can accomplish all these glorious things together. We are also, I am also, uh, tremendously thankful to you for your support of being able to ask the state for the pre-designed monies for the Duluth Academic Health Center, where if this becomes reality, which it should, it's going to become the kernel, the center of gravity of that new health uh, district in, in, in Duluth. All right, so in sum, uh, we are delighted to be here. We are delighted to be of service to you. We thank you for your time, for your support, for your leadership. And uh, Dr. Sick and I are looking forward to your questions, observations, and guidance. Thank you. Chair Paul. All right. Uh, uh, Dean Toller, Dr. Sick, thank you for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. And I'm going to open it up uh, to uh, my colleagues for questions in just, a, in just a minute while we're waiting for those hands to raise. Um, I thought I'd jump in with a, a question that, that, that I have. Um, uh, well, I had many, many, but I, I was struck by the um, continuing education opportunity. Uh, and, and Dr. Sick, I think maybe this question is for you. Um, and for some reason, I hadn't thought about that in the past. But as as you know, as I reflect on other professional schools, you know, business schools, as an example, uh, executive education, continuing education, is um, has be, there's tremendous demand for it. And in some, uh, I think, in some business schools, the professional education, you know, activity is you know rivals uh, core programs in, in its demand. And so the question is, can you maybe comment a bit more on the opportunity of continuing and professional education, uh, where you know where the key opportunities are, what what uh, you know uh, that might look like in the future. Do we think there's more to go for there? Just seems like a, a really exciting opportunity. Sure, uh, thank you, Chair Paul. So uh, there, continuing education takes many different forms. As Dean Toller mentioned, all of us, all of us in healthcare, especially in medicine, need to maintain our our uh, education through continuing education credits and through our maintenance of certification. So that's just a core part of our profession uh, and something that all of us go through on variable schedules, depending on our professions or in our, our specialties. Uh, there's opportunity for us as an as a institution, especially in healthcare to educate our professionals uh, who are out in practice. And this is a key focus at our Center for Interprofessional Health is having over the next coming years. Uh, we know that we can educate our students who are going through our system now to practice together on teams, on interprofessional teams. Uh, but many of us, I'm guessing both of us here, did not, did not get that education in our own system. I uh, went to the University of Rochester in New York and, and as great as that education was, I don't remember doing anything in partnership with any of the other professions with education. Now, granted, that was a few years ago and things have evolved. So we are now focusing on our faculty development and what we call preceptor development. Uh, preceptors are those, those uh, professionals out in the community that we rely upon to teach our, our students from the different professions how to do their work in practice. And so we are deploying over the next couple of years uh, modules and uh, educational workshops to reach out to those professions uh, and those working professionals. Anything to add to that? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Steves, uh, who's on the list? Uh, we have Regent uh, Hipsch and Regent McMillan. All right, we'll, we'll go in that order. Regent Hipsch. Um, th thanks a lot, uh, Chair Powell, and um, thanks for the presentation. 
Uh, for me, it feels like we have a really good pipeline of students that want to go into healthcare professionals at a very young age. And then the, the um, ceiling is where they can't get through is when they get into medical school. They want to go to medical school. So they have their degree and whatever, and they apply to medical school, and we let 6% in or something like that. And um, so it's kind of a supply and demand situation. Unless we increase the supply of doctors, we're never going to have doctors that we need in our populations across the state. And uh, that's going to also raise prices. So it behooves us to me to expand the number of doctors that we're allowing into medical school and figure out ways to educate them and to try to serve the, um, the demand. Let's look at the demand first and then let's find, meet that with our supply of doctors. And really, since I've been a small kid, we've been short of doctors. <laughs> so we <laughs> haven't been doing that. Never worse. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, I was smaller, but, I was never smaller. but uh, anyways, I appreciate your comments all the time. <laughs> it gets me off track with some of his comments. That's okay. Um, anyway, I think that in order for us to really achieve our goals, we're going to have to figure out ways to get to that top tier. And if, you know, in, in my own town, I talk about perm a lot because that's something I know about. When we have doctors, we get more people wanting to be nurses and then we want to, yeah, and other, and other things too, if we have good doctors. If we don't have anybody, nobody, nobody, there's that leadership void. And so anyways, I just want to point that out and get your comments on that. Here, Paul, Thanks, Regent Fitch. Uh, uh, are you presenters, gonna have, yeah. I'm sorry, I yeah, didn't see you there. You. Okay, um, you know, I like the camaraderie over there, you know, but uh, <laughs> to respond to your question, you are absolutely right. You know, I, I really think this is a, supply demand as well uh the, the the local is important i can tell you that we are in the plan of expanding the medical school classes i'm gonna let you on a secret semi-secret you know yeah. if the duluth expansion goes well you know that's another opportunity for our medical school to be extremely relevant and to what you said this is actually quite important there are many many people in the uh, at this university, for example, 80% of people who go to College of Biological Sciences want to be medical doctors. And that's obviously not going to happen. And But they can be, and you essentially made my point, they may be phenomenal nurses and they may actually realize their potential and be much happier in many ways than as medical doctors if they were a, a, a nurse or a, or a dentist or I don't know, vet. You know, and there are there are many, many opportunities. So one of the things that Dean Wellich and I have been thinking about how first in Duluth and then in Twin Cities, how we can actually capture this, this glorious noble momentum, this desire to be of service to others in time of their suffering. Basically, that's what healthcare is. Uh, and channel it in a way that a uh, that an uh, unfavorable decision from the medical school admission process does not turn this person away from healthcare. And Dr. Sick made a very good point, you know, that it's the team. I can tell you that my OR team, my bone marrow transplant team, everybody is the same. You know, we do different things, but nobody, there's no hierarchy. <laughs> we do different things. And I think that once people understand from the training, you know, from this interprofessional education training to the reality of the practice, that this is how it is, we will get the numbers that we need. Okay. The last thing I have to, you know, yeah. say, if I may, our family medicine uh, program just came back, you know, the ranking, we are second in the United States. That's, that's incredible. If you look at the, at the rankings that are, uh, that are spread across the medical schools in the United States, there are 158 medical schools, and there are only two medical schools that are in the top quartile for NIH funding, for training of primary uh, care physicians, which is exactly region here, which you asked, and uh, deploying physicians to underserved communities. And that's University of Washington, I had to say that, but also it's your university, University of Minnesota. Mm. Chair Powell. Oh, thank you for that. Uh, Regent Hipsch, any, uh, any follow-up? No, just a quick, just one little quick follow-up. It's, it'd be more encouraging for parents to encourage their kids to go down to medical and to be a doctor if there was a higher acceptance rate. It's hard to, it's hard to um, encourage your kid to be a doctor 
if you've got a 6% chance of getting into medical school, for instance. So we have to, in that pipeline, somehow we have to encourage these other avenues that you're talking about. So we keep them interested in the healthcare and not, you know, shift them all, all the way over. So thank you. Thanks, Regent Hipsch. Uh, Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. And uh, thank you, uh, Drs. Tolar and Sick for this presentation. I'm curious if we can scratch a little bit below the surface of comments you both made around the challenges that we face incentivizing healthcare workers to stay in this world where, where agency nurses and locum doctors, it's just, it, COVID has put a spotlight on the fact that if you want to travel, and you're willing to upend your life a little bit, you can make double or three times what a person working right next to you in a healthcare delivery setting might make, and they want to stay where they are. I think about my time in leadership in a utility, and I can't imagine the internal pay equity concerns that creates. How, as, a health, as, a, as an academic medical center, apart from just increasing the supply of people to get at that core issue. What else can we do to help that? Because you touched on it, both of you did, and I'm curious if there's more than just getting more nurses into the pipeline, more doctors, more of everything. Is there things we can do to help address that? Because it's just gotta be a monumental problem for providers. Chair Paul, Regent McMillan, I'll go first then. Or you wanna go first? Lynn? You are much smarter than I am. Uh, <laughs> so you are absolutely right. You know, this is, this is both, both complicated and simple. Uh, the data are that one in five physicians over the last two years will leave their profession. They are just done. They are, they are just done, not only because of the usual sort of a burnout stuff, but they are done because it's just such a stressful uh, time. And, it, you know, as always, you know, family plays into this, geography plays into it and so forth. I personally think that the, the, the contra to the, what has been called by others, the great departure. It happens in other spheres of economy as well. But the healthcare is the largest economy in the United States. 18% of GDP is there. We are the largest employer in general. And um, it's, it's more you know, tangible in that. I would go to the basics, to the basic principles. If I can ask my physicians, my dentists, my nurses, my vets and, and everybody else, if I can ask, and get a positive question, put positive favorable answer to two questions. Does your organization, my organization care about me? And am I respected by my organization? These two things decide predominantly whether people come or, uh, and stay or go, not money. You know, the ballpark, you know, is necessary. Yes, there is a fair market value for, you know, all these healthcare professionals, but it's really not the bonuses. In fact, I personally think that the inflation of healthcare that has been going on since 1967, uh, who owns that healthcare inf inflation, you know, has been shifting, you know, from the, from the state to the employers to the people, right? And today, when you ev your average deductible in the United States is $5,000, and majority of the families in the United States cannot withstand $500 extra bill, that really pushes us to move from the fee-for-service kind of economy to total cost of care. And that's where James Hereford and I and others you know, are thinking about how to get to the that upstream so that we focus on the prevention, the focus on, everybody knows this, it's much, much better for everybody to <clears throat> not get stroke, to not get MI, to not get cancer, right? Uh, and, and, and get in, in, in that upstream. And I think that to your question, Regent McMillan, what it means is that if we can put together the teams in a way that we provide we provide support for our people. It's almost like a customer service for our people that we provide them means to make a contribution that makes their personal and professional lives meaningful. That is much more sticky, much more important than any kind of uh, money. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sick. Yes, uh, Chair Powell, Regent yeah, McMillan. No, I, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree that the 
the the sense of teamness is what keeps people together. Uh, it does reduce uh, reduce burnout. We know that, and that's a common reason why people choose to leave. Uh, the the finances obviously are very compelling. Uh, you can make in a short period amount of time uh, triple what your salary would be for a, for a year. Uh, and so that's compelling, but if you have a very compelling reason to stay, as in you, uh, you would like to be part of the same team that you're part of, you'd like to be part of a system that cares and respects, absolutely, that's going to be the, the secret sauce to keep people. It is also, if I may, alignment with the personality traits and instincts that got the people into the healthcare in the first place. Unless part of you has this self-sacrificial, ego-diminishing uh, portion, in my opinion, you will never be a good nurse, doctor. You know, you are in a business of serving others. So if you amplify, writ large, that same instinct applies to your team. You know, my, my transplant team would do almost anything for each other. You know, the, you know, I'm sure that this is, this is replicated elsewhere. And it's very well known that the, 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 uh, the, the worst possible outcome of a complicated and complex healthcare system is that you make it impersonal, that you use human glue for bad system, and you ask these individuals to perform heroic acts because of bad operation or whatever you have. And if you can prevent that from happening, people will come and will stay. All right, thank Regent you, Dr. McMillan, Chair Powell. Yeah, Regent McMillan, uh, any follow-up? No, thank you. Uh, Mr. Steves, anyone else? Uh, Mr. Chair, we have Regents Swigum and Davenport on the list. All right, Regent Swigum. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. And very, very quickly, as I know we need to speed up, uh, Regent Hipshaw was going to help your supply of medical doctors 50 years ago, and <laughs> then there entered that barrier called organic chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> My mind. Uh, very quickly, Jacob, if I could, I'm really into cooperating, collaborating, or trying to do more with Minnesota State. Um, I'm aware of our partnership, nursing partnership with St. Cloud. Are there any other outreaches or programs or uh, anything we share with any other Minnesota State Colleges, or is there an avenue that we can do that to help the, uh, uh, the supply of medical personnel around the state? Are, are we looking at anything? Chair Powell, Regent Swigum, yes, yep. of course, you know, but I, I have to be careful how much, you know, I, I share in the public domain because uh, I, I'm as motivated as you when you said last time when I was here that we do what is bold and needed. It was a different, you know, uh, theme, but that's exactly what we are doing. We are, our ambition on behalf of the state is to replicate, double, multiply the St. Cloud State experience in all the healthcare uh, avenues and layers and through the state, because we are in every healthcare uh, system in the state, we are in every corner of the state. So why not do this, you know, together with other colleges across the state? Good. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, Regent Davenport. Thank you, Chair Paul, and thank you, doctors. Um, Pretty much you answered my question when you addressed uh, Regent Hips and Swigum in that um, when you say, Dean Toller, that you don't turn people away from careers in healthcare. And just to emphasize that point, um, there's been a lot of time when the U was not at the table, K-12, two-year colleges, what you're doing at St. Paul College, and there's a population of underserved populations that want to be there. Uh, so I look forward to seeing more of, of that because there's technicians, there's for how many, how many technicians or nurses for every doctor? Mm -hmm. 12 or 16 or some number like that. So anyway, you answered that. Thank you for what you're doing. And I look forward to hearing more of that. All right. Chair Paul, Regent David Poor, thank you very much for that comment. I very briefly say you are absolutely right. You know, my shortages in, in our hospital has not been really uh, 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 physicians. It was the CRNAs, it was the techs, it was the people who make the OR, you know, ready, you know, for us. And you're absolutely right. We, 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 the, the part of connecting 
both of your questions, uh, the part of our ambition is exactly that social mission that we go K through 12, we go to the two-year colleges, we go everywhere, because that is the brand promise of this university, that we are able to do this. And, and I'm delighted by being a part of it. Very good. Chair Paul. Mr. Steves, anyone else? Mr. Chair, I do not believe there's anyone else on the speakers list. All right, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Toller, Dr. Sick. Thank you for an excellent presentation. It's always great to catch up with you and uh, uh, all the best. Thank Colleagues, you, Chair Colleagues, let's, let's take a break now. Uh, we'll reconvene at, uh, we'll take a short one. We'll reconvene convene at 20 past the hour for our next item.
Yeah. No, no, I just want you to know, whatever you're saying. <laughs> Chair Powell, that was... we are live, please proceed. All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, welcome back to take our, take our seats. Uh, we're gonna turn now to uh, item 10. And uh, I see that uh, you've dropped off of my screen. Um, can sure, you see sure, me? Paul, we, we see you just fine. You can just go ahead and proceed. All right, I'll proceed. Uh, turning to item 10, a discussion of diversity, equity, and inclusion, another key priority for the board. Like our last item, this continues a series of discussions on this topic. Today, we'll hear about DEI efforts on the Rochester campus uh, from Vice President Michael Goh and Chancellor Lori Carroll. Welcome uh, to both of our presenters. Good to see you both. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Powell, uh, Vice Chair Swigum, President Gable, members of the board. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to update you on the diversity, equity, and inclusion, briefly called DEI work uh, on our system campuses. And uh, you might recall, we began this series kicking off with the Twin Cities update in October of 2021. And at that time, we emphasized how diversity, equity, and inclusion principles are probably and importantly infused in so many of our other commitments in MPAC 2025, but indeed our strategic priorities of representation, of climate, of partnership is best lived and breathed and enacted in commitment form, community and belonging, which is our focus today. As you've also heard uh, from many presentations from my colleagues, even the health sciences earlier, research, and yesterday with a presentation by Provost Croson, Dean Forbes, and Dean uh, Hayes uh, Mays with uh, dentistry, all of the units and colleges, while laser focused, and, and working within the guardrails and the framework of MPAC 2025 and the action items, even with that laser focus, we appreciate how the unique context, characteristics, geographical, regional demographics influence how each college campus unit approaches their work. So for that reason, I'm so pleased to be joined by Chancellor Laurie Carroll, to tell us about diversity, equity, inclusion on the Rochester campus. Chancellor Carroll. Thank you, Chair Powell, President Gable, Regents. Thank you for this opportunity to talk with you about diversity, equity, and inclusion on the Rochester campus. The University of Minnesota Rochester has many gifts, a vibrant city, a distinctive vision, a strong corporate partner in Mayo Clinic, faculty and staff united by a focus on student success, and the gift of a diverse undergraduate student body. That diversity provides us with unparalleled benefits. Not only do we graduate diverse students prepared to enter the healthcare workforce, we also have the opportunity to learn from each other as we live in community. The wording of MPAC 2025's commitment for community and belonging reflects key concepts for this work work that needs courage, authenticity, and curiosity. For this presentation, I focused on three of the action items in commitment four as listed on this slide. I want you to know that we could have a large presentation team. I have many colleagues engaged in leading this work at Rochester, including vice chancellors, a DEI committee, student groups and leaders, our emerging American Indian advisory board, success coaches, faculty researchers, and community partners. You may also find it interesting to know that the students pictured throughout these slides are UMR students. I'm hopeful you will be as inspired as I am by the potential and distinctiveness of each person you see here. Almost a year ago at the March 2021 meeting, I shared with you how Rochester's Blufftop View strategic plan aligns with MPAC 2025. Prior to the system-wide strategic plan, the UMR community identified what we call centering aspirations, which are now connected to the commitments. As you can see here, two of our six campus aspirations align specifically with commitment four. The first 
is a core commitment to respectful human relationships. And the second is focused on intentional partnerships to advance community and belonging. Before I share current endeavors and progress measurement on the selected items, let's acknowledge that gains in DEI are dependent on human interaction, respectful, engaging conversations that build trust and ultimately create an environment of acceptance and belonging. No set of policies or menu of programs will succeed without attention to human relationships. Each year in our summer orientation, students of varied histories and geographies meet for the first time. In this photo, taken in my basement, by the way, first year UMR students are becoming acquainted. They've just finished a trip down the river in kayaks. Maybe you can spot the mud. The students in this picture have now graduated, but in this candid shot, we captured the beginning of friendships forming across many types of differences. The good time you see happening here doesn't represent everything these students experienced during college. There, there was illness, there was heartbreak, there was grief, words like microaggression and, and bias incident are ways of describing some of the challenges. And the concept of ally was important in their experience too, to describe how someone in the campus community intervenes constructively. For this cohort, one practice that made a statistical difference in GPA and four-year grad rates was their living learning community, providing structure and support to enhance sense of belonging. Commitment four's action item 1.3 challenges us to make significant progress on a long-standing situation in the state of Minnesota and beyond, reducing disparities with a focus on undergraduate degree completion. As an enterprise devoted to developing human potential, we must adapt so that every admitted student has all we can provide to support their success. The diversity of UMR's undergraduate student body has grown significantly since our launch in 2009. Over the last few years, the percentage of historically underrepresented students at UMR increased to 70% among new high school students, as shown on this slide. The last bar in each segment shows the current undergraduate demographics, 34% low income, 42% students of color, 47% first generation, of course, some groups are in two or all three of these groups. I know that you are aware that even as the workforce and civic engagement demands increase in Minnesota, our overall youth population is diversifying. We need to determine through research how to educate the widest possible swath of the population successfully. At UMR, we have the opportunity to analyze our practices to discern those that make a difference with students as participants in our faculty's research. In 2019, the Rochester campus was thrust into the national spotlight because we had closed the so-called achievement gap. Journalists from each of these publications, the Chronicle, Hackinger Report, and Washington Post, along with many others, have asked me if that accomplishment was possible simply because we are a small campus. Small and growing, I must add. <laughs> My answer is an unequivocal no. It is not our size, but instead, here they are, our intentional use of research-based practices that yielded this result. Those practices coupled with the very hard work of capable students in a rigorous curriculum. Not surprisingly, the educational practices that have been shown to support student success include ways of connecting students with their professors, staff, and each other. I've talked with you about these practices previously, but would be happy to elaborate in the Q&A if you'd like further detail. As we look to the future at UMR, at least two critical DEI questions emerge. And the answer to both questions is yes. So first, can we at UMR continue to provide students with these proven disparity reducing practices as we grow to, toward our bolder and boldest enrollment targets? So that's a yes, if we give attention to culture and structure, and if we keep 
adapting, following the evidence. A second question is about transferability. Can a set of these disparity reducing high impact practices be adopted elsewhere? This question is critical. Uh, most units don't get to start with a blank canvas like we did, but again, the answer is yes. With a comprehensive change management process that includes attention to culture and structure, collaborative faculty leadership of curricular redesign, and budget priorities that align with the desired results. MPAC 2025 helps us all aspire to broad implementation of practices that reduce disparities. Let's be clear about our measurement. There are three questions. How long does it take a student to, to complete their four-year degrees? This is an important question. It speaks to student cost. So if we look at the alumni data at UMR, we see that nearly all complete in four years or fewer. Another question is from start to finish, how many persist? The projection for spring 22 is 60%. We had a dip last year, and this is an important goal in commitment one. But our commitment four question for today is our underrepresented students persistence and completion rates lower than their peers, statistically significantly lower. And the answer at UMR is no. While we're proud of these outcomes, the current student challenges are most certainly unprecedented. And when we finally get to post-pandemic hindsight, and I surely hope that is happening soon, much will be investigated. How sense of belonging is sustained or eroded when learners are disconnected from each other and their context includes so much heartbreak. How the value of undergraduate education is perceived when families are challenged financially by unemployment, inflation, and more. And we'll know more about the intersections among mental health, resilience in prolonged crisis, financial instability, and persistence in educational progress. As I often say to the campus community, onward, learning as we grow. When our African Cultural Club Vice President, Reddit Tillahan, was interviewed by the Med City Beat, she talked about her inspirational peers, as you can see on this slide. What remains a core DEI strength at UMR is the diversity and determination of our students and our commitments to continue listening to student leaders while looking at data. We move now to the second action item of focus for this presentation. I love the language choice in 2.3, seriously. These words reinforce how important it is that we continue to grow in our habits of interaction. One of the ways UMR has been providing this education and training and measuring results over many years is with the Intercultural Development Inventory. The IDI, it's not only a val valid and reliable measurement tool, it's also a learning tool. And we have used the IDI for pre, mid, and post testing with all of our undergraduate students since 2015. This process is embedded within required coursework. Students complete the inventory and then meet for a personalized debriefing and reflection conversation with a trained faculty or staff member called a qualified administrator. The debriefing conversations and longitudinal measurement contribute to elements of intercultural competence, including cultural self-awareness, cultural awareness of others, and behavioral shifting to bridge cultural differences. To date, 63% of students show a statistically significant increase in their IDI developmental orientation scores between year one and year four. While sometimes training that involves the transmission of information is necessary, for deep and lasting change, interactive dialogue is vital. At UMR, we host monthly diversity dialogues. This month, we focused on first-generation students launching the discussion with the book we're reading, The Privileged Poor by Anthony Abraham Jack, relevant data and stories from a UMR graduate and a Rochester community member. Now, these diversity dialogues are more than just chit chat. Uh, these structured conversations hold the potential to clarify and shape thought, to connect people and ideas while building trust, and importantly, to provide the opportunity for learning. Authentic inclusive dialogue 
is essential to sustain our democracy and thus is an essential element of public higher education. Freeman Rabowski, retiring president of University of Maryland, Baltimore County, has received numerous awards for his <clears throat> success in increasing the number of underrepresented students in STEM careers. He's a mentor, he's a model, and he's also an advocate of facilitated DEI conversations, contributing to the volume Communicate for a Change, revitalizing conversations for higher education. President Rabowski says it this way, how do we have the difficult conversations that can lead us to new understandings of these complex issues? We believe the keys are listening with civility and letting evidence guide our thinking about the path forward. Pictured here are Hmong student leaders enjoying the annual Hmong New Year celebration that they host for our campus. In UMR short history, student organizations have been initiated by students for students. Their leadership contributes so much to our progress on this action item. Students are partners with campus leadership, faculty, and staff. They've launched the Black Student Union, the Rochester Hmong Student Association, Our Roots Latinx Cultural Organization, the African Cultural Club, the Gender and Sexuality Alliance, and the Rochester Muslim Student Association. On this commitment of community and belonging, Participation in these affinity groups is an important complement to the diversity dialogues and other intercultural activities. Another way students lead our learning is through participation on various committees. I selected this photo of UMR senior Neve Nez as an example of a passionate student leader because she has contributed so much to our UMR community. You also saw her featured in the president's video highlight. At present, she serves on our campus DEI committee and our American Indian Advisory Board planning team. In published comments about student leadership and diversity, Neve said this, I tell my fellow students that we have so much power within us. The power is in voice and it's worth using. She has certainly used hers. Another student leader, now president of the African Cultural Club, Christine Chukwakcha, describes her experience in an interview with the Med City Beat here on this slide. In an environment in which we as a university system have prioritized interactual diversity and intercultural competency, the strengthening function of affinity groups is essential. We turn our focus now to the third action item, 3.3. Sometimes I've, I'm given only a few seconds to describe the Rochester campus, and when that happens, I provide three short sentences. Students are at the center, research informs practice, and partners make it possible. I want to pop us back to the slide showing alignment between the commitments of MPAC 2025 and UMR's centering aspirations. Aspiration six, under the line there in the fourth rectangular box, emphasizes the intentionality of partnerships to the development of this campus. At UMR, partnerships have been central to our forward progress from the beginning for academic programs, community engagement, facilities, recreation, and more. Key partners in our diversity, equity, and inclusion work are represented here. Wonderful organizations in the Rochester area. I'll share just a few examples of how those partnerships are advancing commitment for. Invest in success emerged from our partnership with Mayo Clinic's Human Resources Leadership, a group committed to diversifying their workforce and thus lowering health disparities. DEI aims and values are embedded in Mayo's bold Forward 2030 plan. Just this week, we selected the third cohort for this program. To date, retention is good, even though the program launched during the pandemic and the first cohort will graduate in spring 23, so we'll be able to report on outcomes of this partnership. The Rochester Arts Center is also committed to DEI and partners with us on a number of initiatives. If you've been to this beautiful facility, you know that it's connected to UMR's U Square by Skyway, which is an extra plus in these winter months. Pictured here is the art of UMR student, Paul Cook, part of a year long exhibit of poetry and artistic expression from diverse student voices. Recently, the Rochester Art Center and our partner, the Diversity Council, sponsored a book launch from one of our staff members telling the story of education and immigration. 
uh, featuring UMR first gen students participating. We resonate with the Art Center's mission to present a welcoming, integrated, and diverse experience that encourages questioning, creativity, and critical thinking. With yet another partner, a group of faculty, staff, and community members participated in a national project sponsored by the American Association of Colleges and Universities as the first step toward launching a campus center for truth, racial healing, and transformation. Funded by the WW Kellogg Foundation, these centers are being established across the country. At UMR, our first related endeavor begins next week. We're inviting participation in structured conversations to promote racial understanding. Just a note, this slide, these are not students, they're not UMR students. They're AAC and U colleagues. Our development work with partner Google Cloud to create a new student engagement platform continues. Here you see a Zoom photo of folks who have spent many hours in Zoom rooms together in the last year. Googlers, university tech wizards from OIT, and some UMR folks, of course. There is a glue that connects us, a shared commitment to equity and access, including tech equity, to help more students succeed. According to Google's most recent diversity report, they are, I'm quoting, committed to continuing to make diversity, equity, and inclusion part of everything we do from how we build our products to how we build our workforce. These tech partners are important to commitment for AIMS. And at this moment, I'd be remiss not to thank you again for your investment in this next gen med work with partner Google Cloud. There is so much happening across all of our campuses to advance DEI endeavors and outcomes. For today's presentation, I've been focused on three action items on the Rochester campus. This is a small subset of the monumental ongoing endeavors across the University of Minnesota. I wanna emphasize the role of measurement at, at UMR for 1.3. We wanna sustain our current outcome, no statistical difference in retention or four-year degree completion. Toward that goal, faculty measure many student learning and development variables, adjusting in response to emerging results. For 2.3, we're contributing to the identified aim to increase the number of University of Minnesota students and employees who participate in this type of training our IDI contributes to reaching that goal. And for 3.3, we are expanding and documenting the quantity of partners, as well as measuring the quality and impact of the programs that emerge from those partnerships. The Colleges of Distinction organization has recognized three of the university's campuses with a designation for equity and inclusion, Morris, Duluth, and Rochester. They describe the criteria as follows. Institutions awarded an equity and inclusion badge not only enliven their curriculum with high impact practices, but they also make these practices accessible in a welcoming community. No matter the accolades or measurable outcomes, we know that there is much more work to be done. Cultural humility is critical to progress on commitment for. With President Gable's leadership, and the support of Vice President Go and his team, we are all committed to an ongoing process in which we respond to emerging data, examine history and the current context, engage in courageous conversations, create practical actions, and measure the impact. Thank you so much for your interest in this topic and your support. President, Vice President Michael Go and I will welcome your observations and, and questions. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Chancellor Carroll, <clears throat> for the update and Vice President Go. And but more importantly, I think it's very clear that UMR uh, is leading here and really showing the way for the entire uh, institution for what we can do. And we're, so we're really grateful for your work and for your leadership, which has you know, spanned many, many years. While I'm uh, waiting to see uh, the, the, which questions and comments are going to come in, I just have a, a quick one, Lori. Can you, would you just comment briefly on um, employment outcomes and you know, numbers who stay in state and that sort of thing, just give us a, a rough feeling for how that part is going. Yes, Chair Powell, employment outcomes for our graduates? Yes. Or okay, yes. Um, thank you for that question. 
the, the strata grant that we just received will help us uh, in the coming years to document those outcomes quite specifically. At present, what we have documented is that about one third of our graduates are employed immediately in healthcare careers in our six different career pathways and about two thirds go on to further study. Of the two thirds that go on to advanced study, about a half are taking what has been come to call a gap year. And uh, often it goes on for more than a year, uh, but they are employed in a healthcare career while putting together their application materials, perhaps paying off some student loan. So that's an interesting trend in the last couple of years. But the outcomes for alumni are very strong and we will continue to document the specific types of careers and the time to employment and to advanced degree as we move forward with this strata grant. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Steves, uh, do we have uh, questions or comments? Mr. Chair, we only have one speaker at this point. Uh, it's Regent Farnsworth. Uh, Regent Farnsworth, please. Thank you, Chair Powell and to VP Go and Chancellor Carroll. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, for me personally, and I bet I might be able to speak on behalf of some others, but it was especially helpful to hear this against the backdrop of the visit that um, Regents for Halen, Johnson, Hipsch, Talia Rabe, and I had um, to the Rochester campus not too long ago and, and um, be able to um, have the chance to see a lot of that in action and then hear it today in the boardroom as well. I thought that was nice um, synergy and, and especially um, when it comes to um, work of DEI, I would make this comment in general, but specifically um, against um, the background of DEI, seeing the what's really clear to me, the strong partnership between students um, and administration at UMR, that's something that rises to the top um, for me when I was there, when during presentations like this and in other contexts. Um, I think that's especially important in DEI work. Um, and um, so, so that was kind of something that rose to the top for me today when hearing, I thought um, today's very well put together presentation um, is that we, um, through, through the lunch that we had with students and other interactions on campus, I felt at least um, that, that we really saw um, this um, experience reflected from students directly as well. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that piece. I um, really appreciate today's presentation um, as this work is very important to me I'm across the university. So thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Regent Farnsworth. I see uh, Regent Kenyanya uh, has his hand raised. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Chair Powell um, and uh, Chancellor for the presentation. Um, I want to echo a lot of what um, Regent Farnsworth said, as well as add in a question there. Uh, the the success, you know, especially at reducing disparities and gaps, you have some of those stats there, and I, I think there's even more than that. Um, it is obviously remarkable. It's been we've heard about it, and as you mentioned, it's been talked about nationally. Uh, how are we leveraging that and, and using what you have learned, uh, you as in the Rochester campus, the faculty and, and administration there, to, to uh, improve the, across the system, right? I mean, especially in student affairs and student life and uh, whatnot, I know across the system there's a lot of communications going on, but are we looking to replicate what we can elsewhere? Obviously, we know our campuses are, are, are different and, and look very different. So obviously, you know, everything can't work, but um, how can we share this success? Vice President Go, I think that might, that good question might be uh, for you uh, and, uh, and maybe the president as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Thank you, uh, Chair Powell. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, thank you for the question. In fact, uh, Tessa Carroll and I talked about that. And, and obviously we're, we're, we're sensitive, right, to how Many of our student affairs professionals, academic advisors, career network individuals believe that they have formulas and programs and initiatives that work uh, in our various on our various campuses. I think the takeaway, and Chancellor Carroll and I agreed, is not so much what the program is, is what the principles are behind it, and that what is demonstrated in evidence on the Rochester campus is a sense of affinity, opportunities to gather both. Um, with, with individuals that, that share identities, but also opening up the opportunities to engage with the broader campus. The other thing is uh, leadership opportunities 
um, opportunities to learn about financial success and direct conversations about experiences with racial microaggressions and managing uh, intercultural differences across the campus. Region Kenyania, these are principles that have been studied by scholars. I'll raise one example, Sean Harper and his uh, work on Black student success that I believe many of our colleagues are trying to apply. Mm -hmm. so, so I know that there is work uh, left to be done, but, but many are seeing the evidence on the Rochester campus affirming the principles in which we try to carry this out on our other campuses. But it's certainly very uh, heartening to see it work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, VP Go. Uh, Region Kenyanya, follow up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Vice President Go, thank you for the answer. Um, that was certainly helpful in focusing on the principles rather than the programs, because you're right, they're going to have to be different um, at different places. A follow up uh, for the Chancellor, I, I was thinking as VP Go was talking, um, I think he might have mentioned the word affinity. And, and you know, that's interesting. I, I think uh, people's or just students' affinities differ. Some it's within a, a department, mm -hmm. some it's within the campus. If you're a student athlete, it's within your team, right? I mean, that's really the family that you see in the university. Chancellor Carroll, do you think that Rochester being unique and that UMR being unique and that the entire student body is, is pursuing at least a similar field, right? And they all want to get into healthcare mm -hmm. and it's a very shared experience um, does that help with that affinity and maybe play a role in some of these things? Region Kenyanya, Ch Chair Powell, indeed. I think the passion to make a difference in the world through a career in health is something that all of our sh you know, students share in common. And yet there are many more facets to identity and we turn to the students to listen to what it is that creates that sense of belonging as they move forward. All right, thank you. I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, conclude the discussion now, um, as we have a number of, of, of a few more uh, 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 items here that will require quite a bit of our time. Um, as ever, uh, Vice President Go, uh, very good to see you, Chancellor Carroll. We so appreciate uh, you know what you're doing in Rochester uh, for our system. It's great to, great to see you, and thank you for the excellent update today. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, fellow regents, we're going to change the order uh, here as we come to the next two items. We have some uh, uh, travel uh, schedules that are sort of uh, impinging on us. We'll, we'll do the East Gateway item next. And, um, and so if I could invite uh, our presenters uh, to uh, uh, approach the podium, uh, this, this, this update, uh, uh, we haven't heard about uh, this project in a while. The board approved the concept plan for this project on the East Bank of the Twin Cities back in February of 2020. Uh, and I, I think we can all agree that that um, <laughs> feels like a lifetime ago, um, but uh, we're delighted to be getting this update today. The project is led by uh, the University of Minnesota Foundation. Uh, we're joined by University of Minnesota Foundation President, Kathy Schmittelkoffer, along with uh, Pat Masha, the managing director of the University of Minnesota Foundation Real Estate Advisors. Uh, and earlier in the meeting, uh, I thanked uh, the three um, uh, regent appointees uh, to their uh, advisory committee who I believe are, are in the audience today. So um, with that as an intro, President Gable, uh, will you kick us off, please? Apologies, Chair Powell, I still had my papers in order for the <laughs> original plan. Um, members of the board, uh, creating this more engaged and welcoming entrance to the eastern edge of the Minneapolis campus, as you know, is not only a moment of real excitement and a tremendous opportunity, but it is a specific priority of the strategic plan. Um, it's highlighted in our recently approved master plan and the opportunities to align the actual real estate with university expertise through our Mentor Sections commitment 
and our work to enhance the opportunities for new businesses and startups, our corporate partnerships, techcom, all align with what you heard yesterday during the Mission Fulfillment Committee meeting. These synergies are coming together in a physical sense through the 15-acre East Gateway project located on the east bank of the Twin Cities campus, which is led by our foundation, which you'll hear from in a moment. So taken together, we believe this project exemplifies how real estate can support innovation, inclusion, and collaboration through a concept plan that's flexible, drives partnerships and relationships, discovery and investment with residential and entertainment components. We last discussed this formally when we uh, brought it before you in December 2019, if you can believe that seems like yesterday and a long time ago. <laughs> but today you'll hear a really nice update on how the project collaboration is underway across the public and private sector. So joining us are, of course, Kathy Schmittelkoffer, President and CEO of the University of Minnesota Foundation, and Pat Masha, Managing Director of the University of Minnesota Foundation Real Estate Advisors. I want to thank both of them and our entire team, as well as members of the real estate community, the trustees, Ross Levin, Sherry Ballard, Peggy Lucas, Bill Soren, as well as the region appointees that we thanked earlier, Mo Sherman, Tom Holtz, and Russ Nelson. It has been a tremendous partnership. Very excited about this progress. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to turn the presentation over to them. Very good. Thank you, President Gable. Uh, President Schmidlkoffer and Managing Director Masha, over to you. All right. Well, good morning, Chair Powell, Regents, and President Gable. We certainly appreciate having time on your agenda today to give you a status update on the East Gateway development project. Um, before we start with the update, um, I'd like to recap some of the outcomes as we've talked about since we were last together in this forum. If you can believe it, it actually was pre-pandemic, was February 2020, and we only know what a month later was going to bring to our world, right? So a few really fundamental actions were taken that day, and I think it's good to start with what those actions were, and then we'll bridge um, as we get to where we are at right now. First and foremost, the first fundamental action was a, an approval of an MOU between the university and the foundation, really outlining the roles and the responsibilities of bringing this private development project to the eastern edge of the Minneapolis campus. The second thing was the Board of Regents took action to approve the East Gateway Project concept plan and all the corresponding design principles. You're gonna get a look at that again today. And in addition, as you've talked about, you named three community leaders with expertise in contract law and commercial real estate development to help advise and guide this development. And those three, together with the foundation's real estate committee, have committed hours to helping us get where we are today. And then probably the most important thing we did in this time frame, nearly 18 months ago, was to hire Pat Masha, who joined our team as managing director of Umfria. He brought to this position decades of experience in commercial real estate, both from the legal and the commercial property development disciplines. I will finish my opening comments with letting you know that we are very excited about where we sit today and where we're going as we aspire to break ground on this vision 18 to 24 months from now. So to set the stage, is this the right? Okay, to set the stage, we are talking about redeveloping the 15 acres of land shaded here in that gold on the slide. And as you can see, it sits on the eastern edge of the Minneapolis campus and is positioned to be an important gateway for the community, both within the university and its surrounding neighborhoods. As importantly, the project area and its location next to the university is seen as an important Western anchor to the innovation corridor that may extend all the way to the Capitol in St. Paul. And you'll hear how we are working with our university partners in just a moment, but we are very cognizant that what we do and how we do this development will be important to the overall Twin Cities Master Campus Plan as well. So in our time today, we're gonna connect, uh, we're gonna cover how we are connecting this private real estate development project to the overall university mission, as well as the University of Minnesota Strategic Plan Impact 2025. And by the end of this presentation, my hope is that you're going to feel excited that the execution of this vision and the governance is now well underway. You'll have a better understanding about the concurrent multiple streams of work going on. And finally, gain an appreciation for the number of touch points and collaborations happening across the university and with multiple external stakeholders. As you heard yesterday from Interim Vice President of Research, Michael Oakes, 
our property is connected is to connect our opportunity is to connect our university campus community to its neighborhoods and ultimately to the private sector. We want to create places where people want to live, learn, invent, thrive, and as you heard yesterday, mash up. And this project is well suited to help us achieve this goal. As Vice President Oaks described, our proximity to a robust and diverse private sector community is one of our best differentiators and we intend to leverage this asset as we advance the project. And as you know and heard yesterday, we are not alone in leveraging our world-class research operations and outstanding proximity and place to create a commercial corridor. We have many peer institutions doing this very thing, and we will continue to study and learn from them as well. Vice President Oaks did a fabulous job on the strategy of these commercial corridors, of why and what it brings to the university, the surrounding communities, and the region's innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystems. The East Gateway development is only one aspect of how we can bring this innovation corridor vision to reality, yet it is an exciting one to start with and to anchor what is yet to come. So before turning um, this presentation over to Pat, I'm gonna quickly let you know how this all connects into MPAC 2025. So as you all know, know there are many ways where our, the foundation's overall work serves to support the goals of the university's MPAC 2025 strategic plan. And while I could address this project in each of the five commitments, it most strongly connects in with the commitments and the actions underlying the discovery, innovation and impact commitment, mentor sections and fiscal stewardship. More specifically, if we unpack those three, first of all, action item 2.2 in the discovery, innovation and impact commitment Innovation and impact calls us to enhance those opportunities for new businesses and startups, those corporate partnerships and tech commercialization. We know there is interest by our private sector partners to live and engage side by side with our university expertise. We want this project to help create this very, very much ecosystem. Clearly mentor sections provides us a roadmap for where our expertise can, with the private sector's help, really serve our state and the world. We look forward to that collaboration with our researchers in this effort. And then lastly, this development project will help advance the fiscal stewardship commitment, specifically to action item 5.3, where we know that as partners to the university, we can help deliver a component of the Twin Cities Master Plan to help meet the needs of the community for decades to come. So with all of that as a backdrop, I am now proud to turn this over to Pat Masha, who's going to give you an update on where we at with the East Gateway Plate project. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you all of you for spending the time today. I get to talk about the mission and the exciting stuff that we have going on with the real estate here, and my comments are going to be in a couple of different buckets. And what's important to realize is that the cool things happen inside the building. So part of one of those buckets is really about how we develop the ecosystem and create the ecosystem we want to, to happen inside the buildings. The other bucket is how we actually get those buildings built and how we play the Tetris game with the city of Minneapolis and figure out where to do the curb cuts and where to put the roads and all of that stuff. I'm gonna focus most of my time and attention on the first. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through some of the progress that we're making with the city on getting the project approved. So Kathy talked about how East Gateway is baked into the master plan, and that's really in two contexts. One is how the buildings get built. And you can see, we took this right out of the master plan presentation where the buildings fit on the Eastern Edge of Campus and how they integrate from a physical standpoint with the Eastern Edge of Campus. But as Dr. Oaks talked about yesterday, it's about that innovation ecosystem that we're trying to create. And the master plan itself on slide 46 in December talked about the intent of identifying the innovation corridors to advance impact 2025 by connecting the private sector and other partners with university talent, research and students. That's the language baked into the master plan. And that's really what the proximity of our project on the Eastern Edge of Campus can help deliver. Because we know that for the private sector companies that we talked about yesterday and Dr. Oates referenced in his presentation, proximity is important. And proximity and real estate as a support to the innovation corridor isn't necessarily gonna be important to everyone, but it will for some. And having this location on the Eastern Edge of Campus is critical to achieving the goals set forth in the master plan. So how does real estate support innovation? 
First of all, it's what Dr. Oaks talked about yesterday, defining areas of specialization and aligning disciplines together in one place to create a competitive advantage. There are lots of places where this has been done and is being done. We need to determine where we can compete, where we can have a competitive advantage, where we can best leverage our resources as a university and as a market to support this ecosystem. Now we can provide on the real estate side, well-connected spaces and amenities like hotels, public realm, restaurants, et cetera. But our team doesn't add too much when it comes to talking about messenger RNA research. <laughs> For that work, we need Dr. Oaks and his team, the researchers and the great folks at the university to help define how we put that ecosystem together and really make this project fit within the university community. And we have to do it in an, in, uh, in an inclusionary way. And DEI and DEI principles are going to guide our development as we go forward not only in terms of how we utilize DEI and selecting contractors, et cetera, but also how do we create employment opportunities and investment opportunities for folks that have not been part of that universe in the past. And we don't have all the answers to that question. We know that we need to integrate and work with and engage with the folks who will help us come up with the right answers, but it's important to the success of this project that we look at having, place, uh, having people and companies here Maybe it's the local barbershop instead of the national chain that can participate in this development as well as in the investment and capital stack. <clears throat> so we're talking about creating employment and investment opportunities for disadvantaged communities. We're also talking about increasing municipal tax revenues for reinvestment in disadvantaged communities. This is a project that's going to put additional value on the tax rolls in the state of Minnesota and for the city of Minneapolis, money that can be used to advance DEI initiatives. And then we'll be partnering with other innovative players to develop and implement practices that will address historic income, health, and other disparities. And how are we doing that internally? For us, collaboration is mission critical. And the collaboration that we've had with OVPR, as well as the Finance and Operations Group, University of Minnesota Real Estate, uh, leading the way to advance the corporate engagement center, defining areas of differentiation and strengthening our networks. It's also the joint planning committee that we have. So in addition to looking at what that ecosystem is and how we create it, it's the work that our team does with Mike Bertelson, Leslie Krieger, and the real estate team at the university in terms of looking at infrastructure and things that affect both of us. That might be roads, it might be how intersections work, that might be stormwater drainage, really working to solve the problems of building the physical space on campus. But it's also regional outreach and engagement with groups like the city of Minneapolis, of course, the Greater MSP Partnership that's been referenced, the St. Paul Port Authority, Medical Alley, and others to really maximize and leverage our relationships in those organizations as well. And then finally, structured governance. We have formal governance that's set up in our memorandum of agreement that was approved in February of 2020. So we have monthly meetings with the Board of Regents appointees to the East Gateway Project Committee. So every month, uh, our team meets with Tom, Mo, and Russ uh, to go through project status. Uh, we also have our regular University of Minnesota Foundation, Real Estate Committee, East Gateway Project Committee, and Finance Committee meetings that are our formal structured governance in the foundation. Um, and all that collaboration has been working very, very well. So now I'd like to get into the concept plan and phasing, which is really all about uh, how this gets built and where we are in city approvals and, and provide an update on timing and status. So first of all, to level set everybody on the plan, this is a rather cold computer generated image of the East Gateway project and how it fits uh, next to the future clinical campus and hospital, as well as the future university project, which is the days in 2407 redevelopment. And you'll see that this is a mix of different uses, residential, hotel, big focus on public realm that you recall from our presentations last time but really the driver of innovation and the innovation corridor, which is the innovation space. And that's about a million square feet of what is a 3 million square foot development. And then we've also talked about having a focus on that ground floor pedestrian experience and make sure that we're creating a destination and a place here that everybody in the community will want to visit and attend. A great game day experience, a great campus experience and make sure that this is integrated as a great place uh, within the East Bank campus. So we had to make some decisions about phasing. And uh, this is some additional information that, uh, that wasn't available at the time we last presented in 2020, but we had to make decisions on the timing of this development and how it would proceed. And the decisions that we made is to proceed from east to west. 
So phase one, which would be in years one through five of this development, we intend to develop between Huron and Ontario. Uh, that will take about five years, we estimate, to, to get that part of the project going. We will then skip across Ontario Street and develop phase two in year six to 10. So this is between Ontario and Oak and develop the mix of buildings that we contemplated in the concept plan for phase two. And then in years 11 through 15, we would skip across Washington Avenue and redevelop the area that is now housing uh, Dinnikin House and Argyle, et cetera. Uh, one of the reasons that we chose that timing and that phasing uh, was for affordable student housing. Dinnikin and Argyle is the part of our development where all of our affordable student housing is located. And, and in the next 10 years, we're going to wait and see how the market uh, addresses housing. We've got a housing issue in this market generally, and the students are part of that. And this allows us to maximize uh, the benefits of Dinnikin and Argyle for the next 10 years and see how that market shakes out. And we've, uh, we've made some of our phasing decisions accordingly. In addition to that, when you look at the location of phase three being proximate and across the street from the future clinical campus and hospital, it's important for us to work together with the university at the time the university is master planning that project to make sure that what we're thinking about on phase three and on that part of the block is integrated with the university's hospital and master uh, plan for its hospital and clinical campus. Um, for today's purposes and the process we need to go through with the city, it's important that we put some buildings down and analyze the impacts of those buildings as part of an integrated development. But down the road, as the university starts master planning its hospital and clinical campus, we can sit back down, take a look at that plan for phase three and make sure that we're integrating it well and that what we've designed for phase three is truly supporting the mission of the university at that time. And that will allow uh, a lot of things to, to, uh, to shake out over the next 10 years as we, as we make those analyses. So I put this in just because it's cool. I just, I like the picture. And so I thought it'd be fun to put it in as part of the presentation. But this is really at scale, what, uh, what innovation, what we're calling Innovation Square would look like standing on here on and looking back toward the project. I do uh, hope that the folks from the university and the Arboretum will, will help us determine whether or not real trees can grow on the roof here. I'm not, we're not certain about that, but uh, the picture does look pretty cool. So now our timeline. For city approvals, step one has already commenced. Uh, you might recall that we have to do what's called environmental review under Minnesota law. Uh, in this case, it is an AUAR, which is an alternative to an environmental impact statement for multiple phased projects over time. We commenced that work in October. We brought Kim Lee Horn onto our team to help lead us through that effort uh, with the city of Minneapolis. We anticipate that our AUAR will go through the process and be approved by the city in November of 2022. That is the first uh, domino to fall to allow us to start moving forward with approvals to build the first phase of the project and actually start construction on the site. So we anticipate starting that process uh, toward the end of 2022 and uh, beginning what will likely be about a four month process with the city of Minneapolis to get approval for phase one. So as we do that, we'll be engaging. And one of those things will be engaging with our newly elected officials uh, as, and, and other political representatives and others in the university community, as well as going through a branding process uh, for this project. It will not be East Gateway forever. Uh, it also will not be Motley. So we have, uh, we have engaged Nika Creative to help lead us through that process. And we are working with university relations on the process of branding and renaming this part of the project going forward. So then it's preparing to build. And uh, the lawyers in the room can appreciate that we have things like title registration, building design and financing to do, a lot of due diligence to do on the land, really the nuts and bolts of how you take something that was used for, for some other purpose for the last 40 years and turn it into something that will support development of the scale that we are proposing here. So there's a lot of work that we're doing uh, internally. That's the work we're doing with the university real estate folks, as well as the office of the general counsel to work through these items. And through all of this, it's about talking to tenants. As Dr. Oaks talked about yesterday and the connections that we have in leveraging our relationships uh, from the university and the foundation side to talk to our friends and, and recruit tenants to this project. So hopefully all that will lead to a potential building start of phase one at the end of 2023. 
so late summer, early fall of 2023. And while we're doing that, we'll be planning the second and third buildings, which comprise the first phase. Uh, very excited to get that part going, obviously, get through the processes we need to get through so that we can start making physical improvements on the land. So in summary, and to wrap things up and touch on the points that we've tried to hit on, number one, this project is connected to the university's impact 2025 and master plan. And we're trying to leverage that place and sense of place to really lift up and support the research mission and priorities with real estate. And those partnerships and relationships are critical to our success. The partnerships, not only with the university, but the economic development organizations here, the corporate leadership in the city of Minneapolis. And we have multiple execution paths and a lot of things to do, but we're on schedule right now for a groundbreaking ceremony in the summer or fall of 2023. And we're gonna keep working hard and keep our fingers crossed that everything we get to do, that holds. So with that, thank you very much for your time. And we would love to have any questions or comments. Thank you. Uh, thanks Thanks very much, Pat, for the update. And, and Kathy, thank, thank you all. Um, and while the questions are racking up, I'll, I'll jump in again. Uh, Pat, maybe, why don't you, uh, if you would, give us a comment on what are the, you've been at this now a year and a half, what are some of the, you know, the big learnings um, that you've, uh, you know, had, maybe some adjustments, you know, since you've started working on this project, I mean, thinking back over the last 18 months. Regent Powell, thank you for that question. It's a, it's a great question. Things have changed since uh, February of 2020. And there was some reference, for instance, to inflation. So you might ask the what ifs, uh, what, about, uh, what about this, what about that? Inflation is a big factor. Um, the impacts of COVID-19 and how space is used is a big factor. That's been a big change since February of 2020. Uh, those are two, two things that I would put in, in the same category in the sense that thankfully we weren't starting construction in the middle of building a building when those happened. Um, we have the opportunity to step back and see what the impact of COVID-19 is on the use space and how people are going to use space going forward and then design our buildings accordingly. Uh, inflation, I talked to a con contractor friend of mine the other day. He said, uh, uh, you know, the identical building today that he built two years ago is about 40% higher. Uh, we need time for that to shake out and, and see what, uh, what parts of, of this inflationary environment are permanent and which are more transitory and as we go through our due diligence and, and put our, our um, thoughts together on how we're going to finance and put this project together, we will be able to analyze that and, and see where that market shakes out before making those final decisions. I think the other thing, Regent Powell, to respond to your question is we've got new city leadership. And, and uh, we have a, we're now working in an environment where we have a strong mayor system uh, with that, uh, uh, when that was passed. And we've got new leadership in Ward 2 and, and elsewhere in the city council. And that's a great opportunity uh, for us to get new ideas and new thoughts. It's an opportunity to educate and discuss and to really work together with new leadership to come up with some great solutions and work on a great project that will be impactful for our region. So I think those are three, uh, I would not consider them challenges. I would consider them things that happen in the normal course of what will be a 20 to 25 year development and things that we have to be able to uh, be flexible and respond to and, and see the opportunity in all of them. Very good, Pat, thank you. Uh, Mr. Steves, what, uh, what do you got? We have Regents uh, Swiggum, uh, Hipsch and Rosha. All right, let's go then and let's go in that order, Regent Swiggum. Well, Mr. Chairman, very, very quickly, Pat, it's that cool picture that sold me on the project. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like pictures. <laughs> And I think you have answered my question maybe to uh, uh, Chairman Powell. My question was going to be, what are you know barriers or obstructions or challenges? What's the biggest ones you're facing right now to get to that picture being a reality in 15 years? And I, I think you maybe referred to it, so I'll pass on to Regent Hips. All right, thanks Regent uh, Swigum. Regent Hips. Uh, thanks Chair Powell. Um, this is really exciting. Thank you for your work the last couple of years or three years, whatever it is. I think this is a real game changer, not only for Minneapolis, but for the University of Minnesota and the whole state. So congratulations and keep moving forward. This is really, really exciting. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Regent Rocha. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, presenters. Um, very happy 
to, to hear the conversation about housing, um, student housing in particular, um, as I've uh, raised uh, ad nauseum on this board that you know, we are very low in our dormitory space, lowest in the Big Ten for uh, dormitory spaces per pupil or per student and uh, you know, in an environment that, that would, <clears throat> might want to have the highest just from, a, from the standpoint of, of density and so on. And so to the extent that you're able to really maximize the capacity to provide, not necessarily a dormitory as it's part of this project, but housing that would serve that purpose. Um, and it ties a little bit into my third point. The second point I wanted to raise is, um, is just, you know, we talked at one point in, in, in making this transition that by moving this to the, the structure with the foundation and I'm free up in the lead, we are now subject to some of the limitations that the city has on things like parking. Um, and we're just wondering if that, you know, how, how we would approach that as we go forward, because uh, one of the concerns is that um, there's a high amount of demand here, um, can, you know, could put some strain on our limited capacity to, to, to support that. And obviously anything we can do to work with you on maximizing that I think is great. Um, and I don't know if, if anything is really developed with that over time. I don't uh, know if that, it's necessarily right, but uh, the last point, which ties to the first point on, on kind of the housing concept is um, this, this discussion or the, the transition occurred a month as uh, uh, um, Chair Schmilkoffer pointed out um, a month before all of the, of, of the issues with the pandemic came forward. Um, also before a lot of the safety and security issues that we're dealing with right now. And just wondering, as that has the consideration of the, the safety and security challenges, and we're gonna be getting a presentation on that here shortly, um, has that had any impact on how we look going forward and as we work with uh, the new leaders in the city and so on um, for finding uh, ways of, of really maximizing this? Has that been part of the analysis? Uh, and I'll, I'll uh, yield to a response. Chair Powell, Regent Rosha, thank you for uh, for both questions. I'll I'll touch on the parking question first. And in parking, uh, it, it, we're getting a little bit further down the funnel of, of things that uh, we have to solve in order to continue moving this project forward. Parking is a big one, and and we're dealing. I mean, the city's uh, from a policy perspective does not encourage mm -hmm. significant parking, but the market does. So it's about striking the right balance. And it's about striking the right balance in this area, which is not only our project and what we're going to add to it, but also the university's needs for parking and the neighborhood's needs for parking and, and trying to work out um, a collaborative and district solution so that we are efficiently building parking resources. So a lot of the work that, and a lot of the discussions that we have in those joint planning committee meetings every week uh, revolves around how we're addressing parking and working on that together uh, going forward. We don't have all the answers yet. It's also an expensive thing to build. Um, so that is part of, uh, of the work that we have to do in order to provide a sufficient level of parking to satisfy market demand while keeping in mind that these are long-term investments and how we try to you know, get to campus, how we get to the East Gateway project might over the next 20 years change quite a bit and make sure that we're making smart decisions on that basis. Uh, safety and security is always, has to be top of mind anytime you're making investments like this in a project. And, and vibrancy is always the one thing that, that makes a place feel safe. And I think that by creating vibrancy is something that we can do to really help make this safe. But we're also keeping an eye and, and, and want to understand in the planning process, there are physical things that can be done and making sure that that gets incorporated in. And some of the work that the university is already doing in that regard and making sure that we're sharing best practices to try to make this as safe an environment as possible for, uh, for the people who are going to be living here, working here, visiting here, et cetera, uh, so that it, uh, it really does become part of a truly safe campus. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Steves, any other uh, questions? I believe the last speaker is Regent Kenyanya. Okay, uh, Regent Kenyanya. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and presenters for the presentation. Uh, I think this is really excellent. Um, Regent Rocha kind of preempted one of my questions. I think President Schmidlkoffer could have guessed it too. <laughs> yeah, I think I've brought it up every time, the housing issue. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm glad to see that it, you know it was taken into consideration by making that phase three um, to to give the appropriate time to make sure that uh, uh, it's addressed. You know, and something 
that's also affordable is, is there in the substitute. So appreciate that. Um, also, uh, similar, not parking specifically, but uh, transit. Um, I know that's something we've talked about um, specifically uh, here on, is it, um, as you get in, into 94, um, that's, that's, that's quite a bottleneck and, and will continue to be one. I know that, you know, there's probably, you know, the, the city, state, county, everyone has to be involved in that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not developments there. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that. Uh, my question is looking at this uh, picture on, it's 227 in the docket. I apologize. I'm not sure what it is in the slides where you have residential hotel, public, public realm innovation space all um, mapped out. Um, I, I was curious if you could speak to uh, the thought behind the placements. I mean, I, I'm sure there was a rationale of why to put the hotel here versus not there. Um, obviously, as it, as it interacts with with um, you know uh, the the athletic venues, um, campus housing, and the clinical space, um, what was the thought around where to place those different um, aspects of the project? Uh, Chair Powell, Regent Kenyanya, thank you for that uh, that question. That, uh, the the concept plan and a lot of the work and the reasons for uh, the concept plan as it ended up and as it was approved by the Board of Regents. Uh, most of that work was done before my time, so I was not in the room at the time that part was put together. Um, but uh, I know that one of the big factors was, was trying to accomplish and accommodate what we've called the solar bowl effect and try to try to develop a, a, an urban scale level of density uh, while making it feel not like you're walking right down the middle of downtown and, and bringing more natural light into the project and making it feel and making that public realm space uh, feel a little bit more welcoming. So there are two components to that. One is the terracing of the buildings to, to create that effect. And that can be accomplished with the terracing or, or just with an angular roof design to get that effect. But it was also thinking through um, a development plan that would push some of the higher, taller buildings toward the back and, and to help create that. So that's one of the reasons why the phasing ended up uh, the way it did, and, and in part how uh, we ended up with some of the residential and the hotel space on the back end. Um, and, and part of it also is just the, the Tetris game and fitting, fitting the buildings and the different uses within the boundaries of the real estate. And, and if you're going to take a large chunk of space and turn it into a pedestrian walking space, that means you have more limited space to build the buildings. And there are some types of real estate and uses that require larger floors than others. So, so part of it is figuring out, okay, this is the size of a building that we can actually fit here if the public realm space is important to us. And that will help drive sometimes what that use might be. I think Thanks, the only uh, thing Regent, that I... Regent, oh, go oh, ahead. Sorry, sorry, Kathy, go ahead. No, I would just add also as well, as you know, that this is a phase three, or there's three phases to this project. You know, we're looking at 15 to 20 years. Certainly as we go into each phase and each building on those phases, there'll be market study in terms of what's the highest order of use. Um, and so as we started the concept plan, obviously there was a big need for hotel and conference center. You know, if that changes over the next 10 years, we will be back in terms of what that concept plan means. But um, I think it was a really good start in terms of trying to put uses uh, to, the, to the property and to do it in a way um, as Pat talks about, that fills that Tetris puzzle in terms of the things we want to do. All right. Regent Kenyanya, does, did that get at it? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I think that did answer it. I mean, especially the, um, the architectural constraints, um, you know, I mean, those make sense. And, and to Kathy's last point, um, I, I think that answered the question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much, uh, Pat, Kathy. Thank you very much for the update. We really appreciate it. V super exciting. And, uh, you know, best wishes, good luck as you move through the uh, permitting stages with the city. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for accommodating our schedule. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll move now to uh, our final discussion item, which is an update on public safety on the Twin Cities campus and implementation of the university's MSAFE programming. Uh, joining us for this uh, very important update uh, are Senior Vice President Myron Franz and two members of the MSAFE implementation team, uh, Associate Professor Kathy Quick, who serves as co-chair, 
and Assistant Dean at CLA, Emilius White, who serves as a subcommittee chair. Uh, I wanna welcome, uh, welcome all of you. Uh, President Gable, I think you've got some introductory uh, comments before uh, turning it over to our presenters. I do, yes. Thank you, Chair Powell, Vice Chair Spigum, and members of the board. So recent times and events have inspired us as a university community to reflect more about what it means to feel respected and included. We've devoted a lot of our attention during the course of this board meeting and during the course of our work over the last couple of years to these concepts. And then specifically how all of that comes together to make all of us from all of our different points of view and lived experiences feel safe. There's no question that we all want a safe campus environment, but we want it to be safe in every sense of the word. And so, as you will recall, to assist us in that work, the university retained CL Alexander Consulting, led by Dr. Cedric Alexander, who's an expert in law enforcement with over 40 years in public safety and also has a doctorate in psychology. And he helped us facilitate conversations with our community so that we could determine where we were strong and where we fell short and to provide any recommendations that could help bridge any divide between the University of Minnesota Police Department's values and practices and our campus's values and experiences. This was all done in the spirit of continuous improvement. It wasn't done as a critique or judgment, but rather in the spirit of all of us getting better together. So Dr. Alexander, as many of you will recall, shared his findings with the board in February of 2021 and he cited an undeniable tension broadly between those who felt more policing was the solution and those who felt more policing was the problem. In the midst of that, we've experienced a variety of twists and turns and challenges socially with the pandemic, with upticks in crime and the need for emergency response. But we've remained committed to the notion that everyone would feel safe and therefore looked really carefully at Dr. Alexander's recommendations, which were literally in the dozens, I think that's right, across eight broad <laughs> categories, some of which we worked very quickly to operationalize. So I wanna share those with you. We very quickly equipped UMPD officers with body cameras, which by the way, they had been asking for for some time. We installed additional blue light kiosks. We have been, and always have been, but with additional focus meeting regularly with the mayors of Minneapolis and St. Paul, around public safety issues. We've been in the process of adding additional UMPD officers, but also added a social worker and a community liaison. We've been working on visibility amongst UMPD officers and communication efforts. We purchased and distributed the Rave Guardian Campus Safety app to all students, faculty, and staff. That's like a virtual or digital escort. We transitioned the Department of Public Safety and UMPD oversight to Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations, Myron Franz, and then there were some others. Those were sort of the, the, the biggies, if you will. But there was a lot more work to do. There is still a lot more work to do. And members of the board to closely examine and implement Dr. Alexander's recommendations, we stood up what we have been calling the MSAFE implementation team, which actually was a step recommended by Dr. Alexander that we have a group intended to look at this bridge between the report and ongoing life and function afterwards. So this team was led by co-chairs, Dr. Kathy Quick, who's an associate professor at the Humphrey School, and Dr. Mylene Colbraith, who's the director of diversity and inclusion for the Graduate School Diversity Office. And we had students, faculty, staff, and alums on this committee. And the committee was charged and participate, and then I participated in their retreats in the fall, but they operated independently in order to review the recommendations from Dr. Alexander and also lean into their own perspectives and experience. Dr. Quick and MSAFE Implementation Subcommittee Lead, Dr. Amelia White, are here today to present you the MSAFE report and to highlight how their work serves as a bridge between the review that Dr. Alexander conducted, his recommendations, and then immediate and also long-term university action. So while both MSAFE and Dr. Alexander's reports explicitly focus on identifying areas for improvement, they also recognize considerable strengths of UMPD. And I really wanna take a moment to thank the UMPD for being a part of this process and, and participating actively and with some openness and vulnerability to the MSAFE review. They've been working on officer skill sets and de-escalation, mental health and cultural sensitivity well before the report came out, including forward-looking approaches from the Task Force on 21st Century Policing and Campaign Zero's Eight Can't Wait program 
to install policies and practice policies and practices aimed at improving trust and legitimacy. But they're also committed to ongoing change. We can all improve. And as a modern police department, which supports UMPD's unique mission to serve the University Twin Cities campus, they are our partner in looking at next steps too. So they wanna lean into the distinction as a university police department without abdicating our responsibilities in the context of our place as a large world-class research institution with values that we treasure that sits in the center of a bustling metropolitan area. So members of the board as president, and also I, I say this often, but I really mean it as the mother of one child who's a college student in a metro and another child who works on a college campus that's in a metro. I think about this from many points of view I don't have everyone's point of view and don't claim to, but I can say from the absolute most sincerest point of view that safety is my top priority in every sense of that word. And in recognition that this creates some real opportunities for us as a community and as an institution and some challenges for us as a community and as an institution, we continue to invest significant resources into these critical efforts. This is anchored in shared governance, not only from what you're about to hear from MSAFE, but also with the work of the University Senate Campus Safety Committee that has been working to define our values in greater community engagement. We're really looking forward to working with them and sharing that with you as well. But last and certainly not least from me, I wanna thank our MSAFE co-chairs and the members of the MSAFE implementation team and committee who worked unbelievably hard in a very short timeline. It was an intense, process at an intense time, and it was completely voluntary. And so we are very grateful to all of them for what they've done and continue to do. And I wanna thank Myron Franz and UMPD Chief Matt Clark and their teams who are very committed to this work. It is not easy, but we all want it to be done the right way and well and in a sustainable way. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to Senior Vice President Franz to continue the presentation with your permission, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, President Gable. Uh, over to you, uh, uh, Mr. Franz. Uh, thank you, President Gable, and uh, thank you, Chair Powell, uh, Vice Chair Sviger, members of the board. Uh, as we hear today from uh, Dr. Quick and Dr. White, we also want to talk about what is also going on. This is a continual process, and so we're in planning stages. So I want to report uh, briefly today, today on the IMPACT 2025 goal, and that is Fiscal Stewardship 5.4 assess and improve campus safety protocols and organizational structure. As I mentioned at the December board meeting, we completed our plan to assess and improve safety in the meeting and I promised to come back and provide more detail. Well, here I am today. The safety plan included in your docket material lays out a foundation for transforming the university's culture, policies and practices to foster a safer climate on and near our campus. The plan is guided by five system-wide safety goals. Number one, support a culture of safety. Number two, create effective, inclusive, transparent lines of communication that, pro that promote safety as a key value across our system. Number three, develop and implement robust planning and preparedness tools. Number four, continually improve our effective response systems and strategies. And number five, innovate and expand upon environmental, mental, and physical well-being, safety systems, and networks to holistically support our campus communities. The goals serve as a roadmap, if you will, to help coordinate and more effectively promote safety and security across our system, improve communication and outreach, and reinforce planning and response readiness. We developed this plan and goals after reviewing existing materials such as safety plans from the Department of Public Safety and the University Health and Safety. My thanks to UMPD Chief Matt Clark and Assistant Vice President Catherine Bonnison for their work in their respective departments. But we also incorporated broader efforts led by the Office for Equity and Diversity, the MSAFE Implementation Committee, which we will hear more about, the Senate Safety Committee, Student Affairs and other campus safety initiatives. We gained additional insight through engagement with students, student governance groups, local businesses, local residents, residential communities, and parents, lots and lots of parents. As the next step, we will meet with senior leaders from all campuses to review the goals and describe the campus safety plan process and resources that my team will provide to help them complete their plans. 
This spring, each campus will form a cross-functional team to reflect on previous planning efforts, identify current threats and concerns, and develop a campus-specific list of objectives for each safety goal. We expect campuses to have draft plans by early summer. Then the individual campus plans will be integrated into a system-wide comprehensive safety plan. We will report on our pro progress again later this year. And finally, we are excited about our $100 million legislative request for safety and security, which would help support all the efforts that I just described and the re recommendations you will hear from the MSAFE implementation report. Thank you, President Gable. Thank you, Senior Vice President Franz. <clears throat> will you be turning it over now to your presenters? You want to? I'll do it. Uh, thank you. Uh, and Mr. Chair, at this time, I would like to welcome MSAFE Co-Chair and Associate Professor at the Humphrey School, Dr. Kathy Quick, and MSAFE Implementation Team Subcommittee Lead and Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the College of Liberal Arts, Dr. Emilius White, to share with you an overview of the MSAFE report. And I would again like to extend my thanks to the members of the MSAFE Implementation Committee and all those who participated in MSAFE's work. It was a lot of work and very appreciated. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll turn it over now. All right. Thank you, Chair Powell and members of the board for this opportunity. And thank you also, President Gable and Vice President Franz uh, for that kind introduction. I'm Kathy Quick, a co-chair of the MSAFE Implementation Committee. Uh, Dr. Mylene Colbreth, uh, my fellow co-chair of the committee regrets that she is not able to join us today. And with your permission, Chair Powell, uh, Dr. Amelius White, a member of the committee and one of the subcommittee leaders will begin our presentation. Very good. Chair Powell and members of the board, during our time together today, we will review the charge and composition of our committee, provide an overview of the work that our committee did in both summer 2021 as well as fall 2021. We'll share recommendations that came from that work and we will propose an implementation plan moving forward. As, as President Gable mentioned in her uh, introductory remarks, the charge to the MSAFE Implementation Committee flows from a recommendation from Dr. Cedric Alexander to President Gable when he presented his report and recommendations to the board last year. President Gable created the committee as recommended by Dr. Alexander, and we see the MSAFE Implementation Committee as a bridge between Dr. Alexander's recommendations and actions that will serve to reimagine and co-create how the university community wishes to be policed. Dr. Alexander's report included 64 recommendations. His report also articulated a key challenge that President Gable uh, mentioned again in her, in her opening remarks. There is a tension at the university and, and elsewhere between those who see the police as protectors and those who fear the police and view the presence of law enforcement as a threat to their physical safety and, and civil rights. Dr. Alexander's report and our committee tried to acknowledge and navigate this tension as we developed recommendations, but this tension is still unresolved and needs to be addressed. Our committee was ably led by co-chairs, Dr. Mylene Colbreth and Dr. Kathy Quick, who I'm here with today. We had an open nomination process that used that was used to produce a group of 29 individuals, including students, faculty, staff at various levels, and alumni. Staff from the Department of Public Safety, including police officers, served on the committee, including on each of the subcommittees that Dr. Quick will describe in a moment. Their participation, particularly from my perspective as the leader of one of the subcommittees, was very helpful in this process. The full committee began its work in the fall, and a small group of us began meeting in the summer as requested by President Gable to focus on three specific areas. Speaking for myself, while it was a tremendous honor to serve, it was also a lot of work. Collectively, at least 1,300 hours were, were dedicated to this, to this task. And for many of us, this was on top of our responsibilities as either a student, faculty, or staff member at the, at the university. At, at the risk of speaking incorrectly or out of turn for on behalf of the members of the MSAFE Implementation Committee, if our work makes meaningful contributions to making the U of M community, to make to creating a U of M community, 
that enhances the feeling of safety for all, including our students, our faculty, our staff, our police officers, our visitors, it will have been worth it. As the committee did its work in the summer and in the fall, there were several actions related to public safety and policing that were already underway at the university. Again, some of these were referenced by President Gable, most notably an approved plan to hire additional UMPD officers, as well as the creation of the West Command Task Force and the creation of a campus safety committee within the university Senate. I mentioned earlier that there was a summer committee, which was tasked by President Gable with focusing on three priority areas, training, mutual aid, and demilitarization. President Gable recommended these three areas of focus because they were pressing community concerns. The members of the MSAFE committee included the MSAFE co-chairs, five MSAFE committee members representing a variety of stakeholders, Senior mm -hmm. Vice President France and uh, UMPD Police Chief Matt Clark. As we reviewed the various recommendations in these three areas from Dr. Alexander's report and discussed them thoroughly, several key takeaways manifested to us on this summer committee. While all of them are important, I want to draw your attention to the last two. A number of recommendations made references to training for UMPD officers in various areas. UMPD officers undergo a lot of training, both before they're hired by the university as well as once they our university employees. As important as that training is, and, and kudos to the police department to prioritizing uh, training for its officers, we realize that additional training is not in and of itself the silver bullet to improving safety. With regard to demilitarization, it became clear to us on the summer committee that a key impetus for calls for demilitarization may stem from a desire to reduce or eliminate what are perceived as military grade weapons at protests and rallies. In a letter to President Gable from Dr. Alexander following his presentation to the board last year, he made an important point about demilitarization that resonated with us on the summer committee and throughout the process. Uh, he, he wrote in part, and, and this is a quote, the concept of community policing, particularly at a university, speaks to how a police department comes across to the public it serves. This, that includes the department's uniforms, its way of viewing and responding to students and faculty questioning its methods, how it shows up at protests, and its transparency over its decisions of what equipment to employ and when to employ it. Quote, militarization, or the appearance of it, comes with showing up with a, disproportionate, a disproportionately large number of officers at a university event, using riot gear and long guns to confront student protesters, and too much of a focus on close collaboration with the Minneapolis Police Department during protests at other parts of the city, rather than walking the beat on campus and in adjoining neighborhoods, end quote. With that, Chair Powell and members of the board, Dr. Quick will speak about the work of the Fall Implementation Committee and review a proposed implementation plan. All right, thank you very much, Dr. White. Thank you, Dr. White. Dr. White was a leader of the subcommittee that considered demilitarization, so he has particular insight on that topic area. As soon as students and faculty returned to campus for the beginning of the fall semester, we were eager to launch right in, and so we expanded the committee to its full 29 members. During the fall, this full committee reviewed Dr. Alexander's recommendations in greater detail with the goal of selecting priorities, adding nuances, and spelling out implementation steps, such as who would be the lead important person, um, who else might be involved, how we would know whether the activities were successful and suggested timelines. To focus in more depth, we divided into four subcommittees, which are organized around the four themes shown here, UMPD roles and responsibilities relating to mutual aid with other uh, law enforcement agencies, as well as other safety responders, such as EMTs or mental health providers, um, technology and equipment, including demilitarization and other questions, and two committees that were focused on the climate and quality of interactions between police officers and other members of the community and how we might improve um, that feeling of safety on campus. Uh, and many of our subcommittee leaders I know are watching online right now and we're, um, are eager to hear your questions and response. Before I highlight some of the key implementation actions coming out of this committee, which I know are of your most central concern, 
I want to highlight some overarching themes of our committee's work. First, there were concerns within the committee and uh, among others about our focus on the quality of interactions between officers and other committee members. And so I want to explain this a little bit. Dr. Alexander noted, as President Gable highlighted and Dr. White mentioned, that there is a tension between those who feel that police are the answer and those that, who feel that police are part of the problem of safety. As the MSAFE committee was getting underway, crime on the edges of campus began rising, as it did in urban areas, uh, including around, around urban campuses in many cities across the country. And the University of Minnesota Twin Cities uh, leadership authorized the hiring of more police officers. This reflects a view that more police are the answer to safety. Since that decision was already underway, the MSAFE co-chairs made a recommendation to turn the MSAFE implementation committee's attention to improving the quality of interactions between those law enforcement officers and the community members whom they serve. Consequently, several individuals who had been invited to participate and nominated in this committee declined to do so as a matter of principle. They could not participate in a scope of work that was limited to improving those community police interactions. Their priority is to significantly reduce policing presence on campus, and most commonly, as you might imagine, the concern that they expressed was for the well-being of Black, Indigenous, and people of color, members of the LGBTQ plus community, or disabled persons who do not often feel safe around police. This brings me to the second point shown here, which is the passion that members of this committee have for bringing their recommendations in this report to fruition. Indeed, some individuals who continued to participate endured exhaustion, grief, skepticism, or frustration. The intensity and burden of constantly speaking up about historic and continuing danger, fear, prejudice against people of color, LGBTQ individuals, and other individuals who have a learned fear of police has not been well recognized institutionally. One of the ways that this came up in our committee was with continual questions about, is this really real? May I trust that the work of this committee will in fact be taken up and implemented? Taking that labor for granted, not recognizing its true emotional and physical cost, or using this process to legitimize the status quo is unfair and demoralizing to individuals involved and damaging to their goodwill towards the institution. In some, without explicit sustained attention to race and other aspects of systemic historic marginalization, members are skeptical and concerned that focus will be on technical improvements rather than on cultural change. And the committee has some recommendations about how to address this. These are some of the action priorities that come out across the 34 recommendations that we did in more detail review. Um, and I want to, uh, at the <laughs> at the um, expense of maybe making a point by doing the very thing, um, over communicating. Communicating to the point of over communicating came up re uh, repeatedly. There was a lot of trust gained, I think in the committee process and Dr. White spoke to this specifically. There was a lot of trust gained in the committee process through the value of interaction and opportunity to exchange, to hear other views and to simply gain more information about the practices of the university's police department and, um, and DPS. Um, and mutual learning about those things that led to a greater sense of confidence in existing practices through that process of transparency. And so there it cannot be overstated the importance of being um, actively communicative about what it is that the department does um, and these safety aspects. Another aspect relates to the aspect of distinguishing the University of Minnesota Police Department as mm -hmm. President Gable began to discuss. University has placed limits on um, the Minneapolis Police Department's presence on campus because of community fear following the murder of George Floyd and others. However, the University of Minnesota Police Department can and should uh, do even more to set itself aside and set itself apart from police brutality. This is good for community trust, for the mutual safe of officers and community members um, that can be gained through mutual trust. And it may also help the University of Minnesota Police Department address the challenges that it has had with recruiting and retraining staff. It is a really hard time to recruit police officers in any department these days. And the university setting its own culture and specific practices um, aside and being very direct and explicit about its values, mission and distinctive culture and consistently acting um, in, with those values and showing their values in action is important only, uh, not only for safety, but also for um, the culture and recruitment of officers to the department. 
Dr. Alexander presented 64 recommendations, which obviously would be an awful lot to organize and accomplish. Therefore, to support a successful transition to implementation, the committee is recommending priorities as asked by President Gable. We're also suggesting an organizational structure, who would be responsible, and some timelines and benchmarks for measuring success. And the hyperlink shown on this slide connects to a very detailed analysis of each of Dr. Alexander's recommendations with suggested implementation details about priorities, who should take point, who else might be involved, and benchmarks for knowing um, how success is being realized. I want to just mention that as Dr. White already mentioned, the university was already taken many safety actions even before our committee began. Therefore, our committee focused on additional steps that could improve safety, both those that are immediate, sort of low hanging fruit, and equally or even more important steps that need to be sustained with longer term attention and resources. And in the remaining few minutes, I will just convey a few of those highlights. Uh, strategic direction relates to the points that were made earlier about clarifying a distinctive vision for public safety on this campus and following through with actions that consistently actualize those values um, in consultation with um, additional members of the community. A second area of implementation relates to mutual aid and coordination. And there has been a, quite a lot of discussion, including by this board, uh, by the regions of mutual aid between the University of Minnesota Police Department and other law enforcement agencies, for example, through the West Command Task Force uh, or with other safety professionals. The committee is recommending setting a parameter on mutual aid relating to the University of Minnesota Police Department involvement in off-campus protests. So many of the groups whom I just mentioned have a learned fear of police because of repeated experiences of police violence right here in the Twin Cities, not necessarily involving, of course, the university's own police department. But here we are in the epicenter of a great deal of international news about this and it cannot be missed. Um, it is jarring then to learn of the university's own involvement in providing security at protests off campus in which protesters are there specifically to protest police violence. Having UMPD officers be deployed in large numbers to defend police headquarters in Brooklyn Center when protesters were there specifically to gather in grief or to protest an officer killing Duante Wright is the opposite of standing aside from and against police violence. Therefore, the committee recommends that UMPD specifically avoid assisting law, other law enforcement agencies off campus in protests that are specifically about police violence or brutality. Dr. White addressed most of these recommendations earlier since he led this subcommittee and so we'd be happy to return if you have questions um, in addition. And again, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, the report calls out accountability and communication as an action area because transparency, communication, and engagement, especially with marginalized groups, are essential not only for improving safety, but for building trust and for accountability. And this work, of course, takes resources, so we've emphasized it as an area requiring focused attention. So to recap, you saw this slide earlier. These are the implementation action priorities that we identified in our year of work. The preceding actions that are laid out in uh, the, the report address needs for over-communication, for distinguishing the University of Minnesota Police Department uh, with its own culture and values, including standing aside from police departments, practices or aspects of culture that have a negative reputation or are unsafe for marginalized groups, centering the concerns of those communities who fear police and their safety. Um, and again, as Dr. White mentioned that uh, more officer training is not necessarily needed. Uh, as we noted at the beginning, University of Minnesota Police Department officers already undertake extensive training and resources are needed, which is the subject of the next slide. We're recommending an organizational structure to hold all of this activity together. I'd like to explain uh, why we're recommending a few features of this. The implementation scope of work is bigger than policing, so it would benefit from an umbrella structure that incorporates uh, Chief Clark and other activities relating to climate and transparency, such as the Senate Safety Committee. Finally, uh, Chair Powell and members of the Board of Regents, thank you for allowing us the opportunity to share this report. My co-chair, Dr. Colbraith, and I are honored that President Gable entrusted stewardship of this process to us, and that Megan Sweet and graduate student Jay Anderson provided substantial report for this effort. And we are also grateful for the participation of Vice President Franz and Chief Clark. We're especially grateful for the outstanding work of Dr. White, Katie Eschele, Nuro Adri Manalina, and Carmen McQuitty as leaders of the four subcommittees and of course to the participants in the committee. 
Notably, Professor Edgar Arriaga, who's watching uh, live right now, was an active member of the MSAFE committee and is continuing in a very important role as the chair of the new Senate Safety Committee. This has been a heavy and meaningful task. As Dr. White stated earlier, the committee members invested over 1,300 hours of effort, which I would describe as thoughtful in every sense of that word. Their work is not done. Our function was to be a bridge between Dr. Alexander's recommendations and implementation. And now we humbly ask that the president and the Board of Regents take up these recommendations and implement them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quick, and thank you, Dr. White. We're gonna uh, open it up uh, now for, um, for, for discussion. Um, and um, while we're waiting uh, for hands to raise, um, let me, um, let me ask the question, and uh, I think I think Dr. Quick, it's to you, uh, but uh, to either one. You talk, you've talked quite a bit about the value of you know, over communication, which um, I, uh, I I think that's I think that I have no objection to that. I think it's a good idea. I want to make sure that I am interpreting that the right way, and 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 my interpretation is that. You know, in fact, the university has um, a very highly trained, very skillful, um, very and very diligent force um, and who kind of know their role and really do it well. Um, but that that is not always, you know, well understood or well communicated <laughs> as broadly as it should be. So that's one of the ways that I'm interpreting that. But maybe you can just elaborate a little more on you know, the, that, the goal, what we're trying to accomplish with, with very, very constant uh, communication. Thank you, Chair Powell, for that question. Um, indeed, you're right that, that uh, the department is, is very highly trained. And so uh, there were members of the committee who were recruited to participate in this because of their interest in safety, who have been paying attention to safety issues, who, when they saw the full log of all of the training activities that the University uh, of Minnesota Police Department undertakes, were stunned by the number of hours and the extent of that training. And it did, in fact, I think in many cases, increase their sense of safety and confidence in the department simply to see that list. And so that would be an example of the kind of over-communication uh, and transparency of making those practices visible simply because, um, if there is a concern about safety, if there is to some degree a distrust of police, uh, for, of, of policing in general, not necessarily this department, you know, mystery breeds suspicion, which causes fear. And I profoundly believe that there's mutual safety for officers and community members um, through improved mutual trust. And so communicating about what those practices are, um, and in fact, gaining credit where credit is due, is an important part, I think, of improving safety on campus. Good, okay, that's very helpful. Um, thank you, Dr. Quick. Um, Mr. Steves, if you could uh, help me now and uh, give me a, the, our list of uh, the regents with questions or comments. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have five on the list so far. It is Regents Farnsworth, McMillan, Rosha, Swiggum, and Mayron. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll start with Regent Farnsworth. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Powell, and um, thank you to our presenters. Um, I've been very interested in this work and waiting for this day, um, so I appreciate it um, and, and know that this was extremely heavy and diligent work. Um, me personally, um, being reminded often, um, especially in this day and age, that I'm a part of a board that oversees a, or you know has a relationship with the police department um, is something that doesn't escape me, you know, very often. So. Um, take this work very seriously. I just have a few comments and a few questions, and then um, we'll be brief to, to get to other colleagues. Um, I completely agree with the points about um, over communication um, and engagement. I think you know that starts at all levels of the university. Um, from this board, given that public safety um, on the Twin Cities campus is one of our official board priorities for this year, um, all the way down. Um, I think it's important, and, and stakeholders, you know, watch um, how we talk about safety. Um, at every level of the university. Um, so I think that's really important. It's certainly uh, campus safety and related incidents is certainly, I would say the thing that I get um, most contacted and engaged about um, as a regent, um, whether it's literally in, on the concourse at a football game or um, at a party uh, with a family member who you know has a neighbor that's 
um, son or daughter goes to the U and, and has concerns about safety or there's many other examples. So I really um, lean in and agree with um, the value of over communication. Um, and then on um, page 28, um, which is dip, there's the docket page number and the report page number. So page 28 of the report, page 148 of the docket where it talks about accountability, transparency and communicating. I think that spells out that communication piece um, nicely as well. Uh, the second thing I'll say that I was intrigued by, which would be page 140 of the docket, page 20 of the report, um, something that I hadn't even really thought about in this whole dialogue was kind of from the research academic lens where you talk about um, under one recommendation that the UMN should create a center for innovation and campus safety. Um, I was just wanted to highlight that as something I was intrigued by. I think it's worthy of further discussion. And again, um, it, it's, it's easy to get focused in the day-to-day, -day, rightfully so, but it's like, oh, I didn't even think about something like this being part of the dialogue. Um, two questions uh, that I'll ask and then I'll, and then I'll stop. Um, one, I guess, would be um, for President Gable or Senior Vice President Franz, just trying to get a little um, understanding um, from administration as we go forward about um, kind of what your reactions are to all of these recommendations and, and what um, understanding we're on the outset, but this is, <laughs> this is just um, happening in the contextual pieces on um, what administration's thinking about these recommendations generally and from a kind of leadership oversight resources standpoint, um, what any initial thoughts on implementation um, would be my first question. And then I'll, I'll ask the other one briefly after that. <laughs> you want me to go first? Uh, I'll go first. Um, Chair Pell, uh, Regent Farnsworth, before I uh, defer to Senior Vice President Franz, I will say just, and this is me speaking um, more personally than in the formal structure of um, identifying a step-by-step -step implementation plan, that um, I really wanted to go through this presentation and hear the feedback and see how the questions went because the committee has given us suggestions, but there's a lot of levers within those suggestions. There are multiple ways in which we could do the bulk of what they're recommending. And rather than get too far along in the thinking of how we would take those next steps or which of those options or ways in which we would take the advice would be implemented, I really wanted to get through this presentation and hear this discussed publicly uh, for the first time and then and then lean in into a more operationalized perspective then. So I will admit I've intentionally not um, thought that through in, in substance yet, but I'm not the only one involved in developing those plans. And so with that, I will defer to Senior Vice President Franz who may have been thinking of this differently than me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vice, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Regent uh, Farnsworth. Well, thank you. I think one of the things, you know, really, you really had to do step back to Dr. Alexander's report to kind of put in context how we're going to be responding to this set of recommendations. I mean, one of the things we saw right away with Dr. Alexander's report was some of the things we were already doing and we wanted to improve on those and some things we could change right away, we wanted to do those right away. And so that was, there was a lot of effort around that. And in the transition with uh, uh, the UMPD reporting directly to me, working directly with Chief Clark, I learned about some of the limitations we have on how much more UMPD can do, right? In terms of training and change. So I think that was one of the things the MSAFE implementation learned about we need to have the officers out doing their job. We can't have them being trained all the time too, right? So there's some natural restrictions here. So there's there's some issues there that we're, we need to think about. But but now what's been, what's so helpful about uh, doing the same thing that President Gable was doing is digesting. I haven't put my 1300 hours in yet on the report, <laughs> but fr frankly, it, it, it needs a lot of time. Uh, there's a lot there. And so we are busy re you know, reviewing and, and analyzing and I've talked to Chief Clark but a number of the issues. And I think the key for us is trying to make sure that we respond quickly, as quickly as we can, and in ways that make sense and that we can effectively do. And, and I think the recommendations in terms of the implementation going forward from the committee were also helpful. Um, and I think, you know, this, so anyway, so yes, we're sorting out what we think we can do and how quickly can we do some of these implementations, but we also want to continue the dialogue because Part of what we've learned through this process is we have a lot of folks now with some pretty good insights and, and familiarity with what we do. And, and that's a pretty valuable relationship 
opportunity right there. So the opportunities to communicate that keep coming through, I think, loud and clear, really are some, some of the things I know that Chief Clark and I have already talked about is, and he's already started implementing is more opportunities for direct communication with more with a wider scope of, of our university community. So there, but there's a lot going on. There's there's the implementation of, of this plan. There's the um, safety plan that we talked about for all the campuses. And there's also the legislative request we're trying to seek additional funds too. So um, that's a pretty high level uh, review because we are at this point of understanding and, and continuing dialogue going forward. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, SEV France. Uh, Regent Farnsworth, can I ask you to, you know, very quickly state your second question? I want to, we got a number of people who want to speak here. Yeah, I'm actually I'm gonna I'm not ask the second question in the interest of time, but just say thanks um, to President Gable and SVP friends. I think very fair answers um, to my question. I know it was, you know, we're, we're at this point understanding contextually what else is going on, but thought um, it, it'd be worth asking and in hope um, to see continued um, engagement um, with the board and communication about how these implementation steps roll out. Um, and again, I just want to thank the committee for some really um, impressive and deep work here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Regent Farnsworth. Regent McMillan. Thank you, Chair Powell. And I'll echo Regent Farnsworth's uh, compliments. This is hard work that generates a lot of emotion, but it's incredibly consequential. As President Gable said, um, maybe nothing matters more than safety. Um, quick question, or maybe it's a quick question. Hopefully, uh, I know it's a quick question. Hopefully, a quick answer. How much, give me a sense for how much you thought about and weighed, and, uh, and, and I don't have an opinion on this, but you, you reached some conclusions about limiting mutual aid. Can you dig just a little bit deeper behind that and let us know what you thought about risks and rewards of that? So the question thank you, for me. Yeah, thank you, Regent McMillan. I'm, you guys, however you want to handle that. Thank you, Chair Powell. Thank you, uh, Regent McMillan. Um, there, the committee was asked broadly to think about mutual aid, um, including the West Command Task Force mutual aid agreements, um, and certainly endorsed uh, the recommendation that uh, Dr. Alexander had made, and that, as President Gable described, was already ongoing as of the time that the MSAFE committee began, which was the ongoing consultations with the Minneapolis and the St. Paul Police Departments and mayors uh, about um, safety on the borders of campus. And so um, there wasn't really a questioning of that by the committee. Um, nor, I think, was there a questioning of the committee in the end. We were asked to consider the question of mutual aid. I think where the committee came down, and I should make clear also as I'm saying this, that we had subcommittees and the subcommittees made recommendations. And that is what we are presenting to you, right? So I, I don't want to uh, pretend that a member of subcommittee D fully understood and completely 100% endorsed something that came out of subcommittee A. So just to be very clear about that. But um, there was a discussion of mutual aid and I think there was very much a recognition of the value and the necessity and the ethic of mutual aid among different departments. The recommendation made about a change in that policy related specifically to the participation of UMPD in protests directed at police brutality and police violence off campus because of the dissonance between statements made by the police department here um, following the murder of George Floyd, for example, about standing aside from that kind of violence, the dissonance then <laughs> a participation of the department in events like that, that while there is certainly um, a value in mutual aid, and I understand the inclination and the impulse of our police chief and members of this police force to show up as they're asked and to be a good sibling and a good partner in those relationships, there's a distinctive culture of the University of Minnesota and their concerns of constituents on this campus that suggest that um, there need to be some limits specifically relating to um, just the incongruence of saying that this department stands aside from police brutality and then standing up to defend a building that people are protesting against an incidence of police brutality. Thank you, Jim McMillan, follow up? Or, or oh. Dr. White, did you want to add anything? You know, uh, Chair Powell and, and, and Regent McMillan, the only thing I would I would add to what Dr. Quick said, and this goes back to the comment earlier about over communication. You know, 
before my current role, I, I worked in student affairs and have had a lot of uh, opportunity to engage with the police department. So I understand that they work help other police office departments and other police departments help us. Uh, not everybody understands that. So when I think about this issue and other issues and that notion of over communication, there's a lot of things about how the police department functions, why they do the things they do that a lot of people don't understand. And I think there's an opportunity to provide more education. Doesn't mean that people might say, oh, totally agree why they should be at Brooklyn Park or here or there, but there's a lot of lack of understanding that they even would even do that in the first place or why they would even be somewhere other than, you know, on university property. Even there are some that are surprised they're in Dinky Town. So again, just for me, I think about why that over communication is important and in multiple ways and at multiple times, because there's uh, one of the things we talked about on the committee, police officers, and, and you can say this for doctors, you can say this for lawyers, you can say this for faculty, you could even say this for regents. A lot of people don't know what they do. You know, but you know what you do. Police officers know what they do, but people who don't do those jobs don't truly understand what they do in that in that work. And I think there's an opportunity to close that 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 information gap. And and with mutual aid is 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 an example where that could happen. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to move on now uh, to Regent Rosha. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a, just a few comments and. Um, uh, in re response to President Gable's uh, statement about want receiving feedback. Um, first, uh, President Gable and Dr. Quick, I would say that you'll get uh, no greater credibility in a, in a program or in, a, in an effort than having Dr. White on it. What are we at, about 30 plus years now? <laughs> <laughs> we've been, I was uh, first met, uh, uh, not, not quite yet Dr. White, when he was fresh out of USC or pretty close to fresh out of USC when he came to the university. And so he has a, a wealth of knowledge here at the university that I think is possibly unrivaled at this point, but so very nice to see you. Um, building right off the mutual aid, uh, I, I really appreciated the comments from both Dr. Quick and, and Dr. White um, on this. My first response is it gets really hard to have a mutual aid program where you have subjective analyses, right? Because we have a fairly small police force here. And if we had a major, major event on campus and we needed that kind of support, um, you know, if each department is, is making a subjective analysis of whether that fits their uh, their perspective. It's really not a mutual aid program. It's really just a request for help and some will show up and some won't. So if we can deal with the concern about with, with over communication or with, you know, communication, adequate communication, so people understand why we would be there. Um, I think that's, that's important. Otherwise, I think we put our, our folks in a, a really tough spot that way. Um, <clears throat> you know, struggle a little bit trying to understand, you know, and, and I think you, you handled it with the right sensitivity. Uh, military grade weapons, it's such a it, it's such a loaded term um, because some people would say, well, effective weapons or we effective resources for a, a circumstance where they're needed. I mean, it's one thing when if the UMPD was rolling up in MRAPs and Humvees and, and up armored vehicles and stuff that you know that that kind of show of force would be so extreme. You can you can anticipate a response to that, uh, but it really again almost comes down to a sort of item by item as to why a certain thing would be needed to address the realities of the day, uh, what kinds of risks that you're running into. So um, I, I think that, again, in the communication vein, really talking through what we mean by that and how we prevent us from, because you know, I, I will agree when I watch um, media reports of different police forces across the country reacting to things, it's like, good golly. You know, it looks like they're trying to protect against an invading army as opposed to trying to deal with people who are trying to communicate concern about something. And sometimes with, with crime, uh, criminal acts in, in, in there as well. So I uh, appreciate that you're, that you're addressing this. I was a little bit surprised. So, so as I, as I kind of see this report, um, President Gable and, and presenters, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of focus on the relationship between UMPD and, and campus groups, campus uh, participants, campus members, uh, the groups under 1.3 with BIPOC immigrant LGBTQ plus and differently abled communities. <clears throat> and that's absolutely critical, no question. But the feedback that I'm getting from the community about safety issues, you know, I would, I would think that certainly one group that I was kind of surprised not to see on there is just women. Um, I think that it's risks for women after dark, risk, risks for women on campus in secluded areas, certainly for men as well, but I think women are particularly affected by it. 
at least that's the feedback that I'm getting from communication from the community, would very much like to understand how that weighs in or how that plays into this analysis for um, traffic, you know, flows on campus different times of the day, what, what's necessary and how do we make sure that those areas are well lit, protected, et cetera, you know, kind of understand that, which takes me back to the last point and then I'm, I'll, I'll be done for the day is, um, is that when I'm thinking about the campus uh, safety issue and the feedback that we're getting from the community or that I am anyway, it's, it's, people aren't really focused as much about the relationship between UMPD and uh, uh, members of the community. It's how do we stop criminal events? How do we stop these safety and security events on campus? Because every time we have another report, even if it's two, three, five blocks off campus, it's, it's frightening people. And, and, and I shouldn't say it's frightening, it's sometimes directly impacting them. A lot of the people that are subject to these uh, types of criminal activities are students, staff, faculty, et cetera. And so that's when I, when I think about this, that's really where my mindset is, is what, what can we do to assist our UMPD understanding that there's a limit to what they can do because of the geographic area, but the community absolutely sees those areas as part of the University of Minnesota um, environment, even if it's not specifically within the boundaries of campus. And so that's, that's what's really critical for me is how can we, how can we ramp that up with, with all of these challenges that we have? And it's, a, it's an amazing challenge and 1300 hours, you know, doesn't surprise me at all, frankly, when you think about the, the range here. So thank you, Mr. Chair. I welcome any comments from the presenters, but that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent uh, Rosha for, uh, for, for your comments. Um, uh, which are much appreciated. Do Dr. White, uh, 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 Dr. Quick, any uh, brief reactions Actually, to Regent Rosha? If I may, Mr. Chair, if I could um, chime in first, if, sure. if you wouldn't mind. Sure, President Gable. Um, with apologies. So just a, from a, an overarching point of view, um, Dr. Quick and Dr. Colbraith were our partners in the selection of the committee, but really the president's office stewarded the creation of the committee and we had gendered representation absolutely in mind. So while that may not have been an iterated member of uh, or point of view, I mean, besides the obvious that both co-chairs were women and the person who charged the committee is a woman who walks across campus, there was um, a pretty even split and that was intentional across genders. Representation was very important, as you might imagine, for the creation of this community, including making sure that we had alums and um, uh, uh, different groups across uh, every way in which we would nuance the term representation without the committee being so large that the chairs would spend their entire time <laughs> managing the committee rather than doing the actual work. So we were very careful about that and feel like, well, one can always improve that it was pretty good. The other uh, point that I'll make before I defer to the presenters is I didn't charge the committee to address the uptick in crime. Um, we have an amazing chief who's in the audience today and a really responsive um, police force who think about the actual emergency response component of safety. Now, that doesn't mean that the committee was not interested in that. And of course, they care about that. We all live and work in this community, but that was not what they were asked to do, um, except to the extent that they were aware that their recommendations needed to coexist with the fact that we are still responding to emergencies, criminal and otherwise. I've said um, before, but it's been a while that this is arguably the hardest intersectionality that many of us have ever had to deal with. You know, we quote Dr. Alexander's tension quote, I don't know, dozens of times now. It's actually much more than that, right? Because it's um, a, it, there are assumptions inherent in that tension that um, um, affect different members of our community on principle and not just on a statistical analysis of trend lines. And so it can make composing a committee and navigating the charge while in the meantime, our officers are out on patrol incredibly hard. I mean, that goes without saying, but to the extent that um, it is not in the report as what to do about the uptick in crime, that is because that is not what the committee was asked to do. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you President Cable. Uh, uh, Dr. Quick, Dr. White, any any quick comments? Uh, yep. Uh, Regent Chair, or sorry, Chair Chair Powell and, and Regent Rocher. One, Regent Rocher, thanks for the, we, we were students together at the Humphrey School many years ago. That's all I would usually say in public. <laughs> um, but I think a, a couple of things, you know, briefly on the, the 
the demilitarization issue. The our, our our subcommittee talked a lot about what is a military grade weapon, you know, and and I, our recommendation says the university needs to just define it and then lay out how they will act upon it. You know, I use the example, a Hummer was an initially designed for the military. People have Hummers. That does not mean they're driving a military grade weapon, you know, and so things that are designed, things that the military uses is not the same as something that was designed solely to be used or primarily to be used in battle. But I think there's a lot of difference of opinion what that term means. So the institution should have a process for deciding what it means and, and be clear about it and then align that with its decisions to buy things or not buy things or accept things or not accept things. Um, the, the other point, uh, and, and while President Gable is right, the committee, we were not tasked with addressing uh, campus safety from in terms of the rising crime. But I think the question you asked Regent Rocha about uh, you know, listening to different groups. And I think one way I would, I would think about answering that, if you're concerned about rising crime, you, there, are, there are kind of clear mechanisms for you to make, to be heard. You know, many of you have heard from parents, we hear from students, you'll hear from the women who are concerned about walking, I'm concerned about leaving the rec center at night. Uh, I think there's not as clear avenues for if you're concerned if your safety concerns are not so much about being a victim of crime, but about what might happen when you interact with police officers. And that's where I think those recommendations about talking to different cultural groups, different uh, affinity groups is not about privileging one over the other, but they have different concerns and may not have a good avenue for having those concerns uh, listen to. And, you know, the last thing I'll say that President Gable mentioned intersectionality. And, and I think about that as it relates to, you know, as a, as a, again, I leave the campus, I leave the rec center late, you know, when I, when I go to the gym and I worry about walking to the bus stop, I also worry about being an African-American male walking on campus at night with a ski mask on because it's cold uh, and how that might make other people feel. So I, I worry about my own safety and I worry about how people may perceive me as a threat. And, and, and when President Gable mentioned intersectionality, I thought of that and I think that's the complexity. And many people on our campus and on our committee concerned about their own safety, but also concerned about the safety of others who may have identities different than theirs or different than the majority. And so all of that was represented among the people who, who were on this committee. And, and Dr. Quick may have additional comments related to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Dr. White, Dr. Quick. Thank you. Um, the points that I might have made have already been said better by President Gable and Dr. White. All right, thank you. We have time for two more uh, questioners, uh, Regent Swigum and then uh, Regent Kenyanya will, will uh, bring us home. If you could be concise. I'll try to, um, um, Mr. Chairman, and uh, actually Regent Rocha asked bordered on one of the questions I was going to ask about uh, the military grade weapons. Um, and I guess folks, uh, we all have the Humphrey School in common. Um, <laughs> we may have taken different classes there, but uh, uh, we do have it in common. And respectfully, thank you for your work. Thank you very, very much to your committee, your, and your committee. Uh, and then I'm going to give you the however. Uh, in a previous life, I knew and worked very, very well that whoever I appointed to committees, I get the answer I want. <laughs> depending upon who I appointed, what members were. And I don't mean that as a judgment, but mm -hmm. I do mean that very, very sincerely. When I put certain people on a, uh, on a committee of health and human services, uh, I knew I would get the answer I would want, depending upon who I placed there and did not. Um, just a comment about, about life. Uh, if I could, my question, I think I, I will give it to Dr. Quick. And what struck me about the recommendations, by the way, respectfully, I may not support all the recommendations. That's, you know, I wasn't on the committee, so I didn't have a chance to speak there. I do have a chance to speak here. Um, I was interested in, Dr. Quick, I think I'm gonna ask you uh, with your uh, schooling at the Humphrey School and your professorship there, um, the fall safe committee, the, the uh, fall committee of 2021. And I was struck by the 
correct and appropriate question that you answered or asked to all members who were going to be part of that committee. And may I read it? It's, is the action action you are considering or proposing going to improve safety and quality of interactions between police and other people? The action, which is, a, I, I think, the appropriate question. Yet, in that M Safe Committee in the fall, immediately, and I'm aware of talking to some members on the committee, immediately a number of members either left the committee or in one way, shape, or form decided to resign or not be part of the process. Talk to me, Dr. Quick, just very briefly about their action in regards to your central important question about the relationship and the actions count. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Quick. <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Chair Powell and uh, Regent Spigum. Um, I, to your point about the importance of a diversity of views, which I believe is what um, you're getting at in saying you appoint the members of a committee that you, you have some sense of where they'll be going. Um, it was uh, at the president's discretion who it was that, that served on the committee, um, but she was certainly very responsive to the recommendations that Dr. Colbraith and I made. It was extremely important to us to have a wide range of ideological positions, lived experiences, staff, faculty, alum, Greek associations, law enforcement professionals, um, a wide variety uh, sort of demographically as well of uh, participants on this committee so that we could have a robust debate among different points of view. And what you see in the report are um, generally consensus positions reached by those subcommittees on the basis of that robust debate and exchange of views, except where it's noted. There are recommendations in this report that are um, forwarded on behalf of a smaller number of committee members where there was not uh, a consensus among them, but there was a request nonetheless to put them forward. Um, in terms of the departure of members of the committee, one of the reasons that we elevate that to your attention is because the views of those individuals who feel that uh, a more reform-minded agenda, if I could characterize that, it that way, around changing police practices, which I believe Vice President Franz and President Gable and Chief Clark are very much invested in, um, was not uh, sufficient to the frame that they feel needs to be brought to safety on campus, um, which might involve a reduction in the size of the police department and other considerations around improving a feeling of safety as well as addressing crime. And so one of the reasons that one of the uh, principal recommendations in the report is to continue dialogue and consultation is not to sort of exhaust everyone through further dialogue, but because indeed there are um, constituents and some of those points of view that Dr. White just uh, described that I think were not fully explored um, through the limited number of individuals that we were able to involve in this project. Very, very good answer. You can see maybe from my perspective though that uh, when someone fails to participate or leaves, uh, that that speaks loudly, very, very loudly to the actions of the charge, which is uh, uh, appropriate interaction and improving safety and communication. So just a comment on my part. All right, thank you, Regent Swigum. Uh, Regent Kenyanya, you'll, uh, you'll wrap this up for us, thank you. All right, I, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, thank you, um, you know, Dr. Cork, Dr. White uh, for the presentation and to all the committee members for the uh, countless hours of work. I mean, you told us the hours, but they're pretty visible, you know, in the thoroughness and, and detail of the report and, and to the president, obviously, um, you know, for uh, uh, shepherding this. Um, I, you know, I mean, I think we all know how we got here. Um, with, you know, the things our state and city has been through. Um, I will just note, it is unfortunate that at the time that we're, you know, coming back to this conversation, we're kind of in the same place with the uh, murder of Amir Locke, um, again, in Minneapolis, um, which just highlights how important the, the work of this committee is. Um, appreciate the conversation that's been had um, and, and just wanted to make a, a few notes. I guess I can start with the uh, the mutual aid, because um, that's been spoken about a bit. And, and I, I think everyone understands um, the value of that. It was noted, you know, that our department is limited in size, you know, compared to others. And, and you know, God forbid, in the case of a really catastrophic 
um, event, I don't even want to name it, um, but I think we all understand, um, you know, that that aid is, is you know, will be needed. Uh, but I think the committee was right in understanding how detrimental um, mutual aid of that kind, right, um, specifically for um, protests against uh, police misconduct and police brutality can be to that relationship. You know, it, it, it's if you're a student and you're hearing the university and the department um, communicate that they're supportive of, of what the community is experiencing and, and you go out to um, reflect your emotion way out in Brooklyn Center, out on Humboldt Avenue and are met, you know, with that same department um, at risk of being arrested by that same department, you can understand um, why, and right or wrong, I just want to emphasize that, that that for that student, I mean, this relationship is 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 severed, and you know, I don't know if it's repairable. But I, um, again, I, I do understand why other kinds are necessary. So I, I understand that's a challenge, um, but I think on, on that specific kind, uh, the committee may have gotten that right. Um, on the question of demilitarization, kind of a mouthful, uh, and I know that word probably isn't technically accurate. And, and we can discuss what is and what isn't as we have today. And I think we did last time as well. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's a matter of perception, which is very important. You know, perception is reality. Um, you know, we're used to seeing officers dressed in a certain way, whether they're UMPD, MPD, or any other department. I mean, there's, you know, there's a standard uniform. And, you know, part of the reason you see departments have officers walking around or on, on bike patrols with shorts and whatnot, uh, at least I believe is because that, you know, it, 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 that's not very threatening. You know, you can interact with a, with a, with a, a guy or gal on a bike and whatnot. Um, and that's just perception, right? It's, um, but when students or, or other community members are met with what they perceive as military or, or just, you know, I don't know, a, a bigger weapon, this, that, and the other thing, it's seen as, a, as, a, as an escalation, right? And, and you can understand this is usually in emotionally charged situations. So uh, I think carefully examining um, the, the, the use and the impact of, of just that, uh, if it is just a perception, it's still you know, powerful enough in, um, in and of its own. Um, I think, and then my, my other two points on, on page 207, there's a comment about um, you know, complaints and feedback to improve the process of holding individual officers accountable. I, I think this is really important. You know, if you follow the, uh, the national discourse we've been having on, on policing and local, right, in, in the past couple of years, one of the things that communities, you know, are, are really hurt by is not, is not um, it's when, when an incident happens and it's revealed that this individual had a history or this individual had um, a complaint year over year, this and that. And, um, you know, because that, that speaks to culture, right? At that point, that's not instant, that speaks to culture, right? And I think, you know, improving the, the transparency and the process, you know, and there, there might be nothing there. I, I, I wrote down, a, Dr. Quick, I, I think you said, um, mystery breeds suspicion, uh, which in turn breeds fear, right? So there may be nothing there, um, but let's remove the mystery, um, you know, to, to make sure we're not breeding that suspicion and in turn fear if, if in case, you know, there is nothing there. And then on, on 204, yeah, there was, I think, a really uh, good comment about the philosophy of policing as separate from code of behavior, right? Um, whether policing or just really any other um, job or position, you know, we, we, we look at the rules, right? What are the bylaws? What are the what are the policies? Um, but you know the philosophy down to the individual. I mean, what what do you perceive your role to be um, in your in relation to to the people you serve, the people you work for, the people you you encounter? Um, that philosophy is so important because if if we're not starting at a a, a, a common understanding of that, it, it makes the rest of the communication very uh, you know very hard, right? Uh, and then lastly uh, will be the question, and maybe for the president, if it's not, uh, someone else feel free to answer. Uh, on th There's a page on the report that talks about system-wide safety goals, uh, how campuses will use this plan, um, and you know a sample campus-specific plan. I was looking for clarification on 
um, if the scope of MSafe was system wide, um, I I didn't believe it to be, and I I took a quick look at the membership and didn't see that. I mean, th there may be a system wide need. I'm not saying there's not, but um, I'm trying to understand the, the the scope of the committee with these system wide uh, comments on this page. But um, beyond that, my my compliments and thanks to the to the committee, Dr. White, Dr. Quick. Thank you, Regent Kenyanya. President Gable, did you want to take uh, uh, you know take a shot at at Regent Kenyanya's question on um, system wide safety goals and whether that is part of the purview of the of M Safe Committee? Yes, thank you, Chair Powell, Regent Kenyanya. It was not a part of the charge. The work of Dr. Alexander's review, and so therefore the resulting work of M Safe was Twin Cities focused. It's worth noting that Dr. Alexander did consult on other campuses. Um, he consulted in Duluth and I believe in Morris um, where they have police departments as opposed to relying on the department of the surrounding um, community or, or other law enforcement agencies from the surrounding community. Um, but uh, the, the, so that wasn't the, the nature of the charge, but the fact that the committee took it into consideration was absolutely within their purview. I mean, they reported on what they, um, on where their thought and analysis led them and they were absolutely given the, the birth to do that. But MSAFE per se is a Twin Cities initiative. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, President Gable. Um, Mr. Mr. Chair? Yes, quickly. Yeah, uh, Regent quick follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, President Gable. On the on that same page, uh, there's some dates with like May 2022 campus specific plans to be available. It was that an MSAFE uh, recommendation, uh, you know, a positive one, or is that a charge to the campuses to develop uh, adjacent plans? President Gable. Thank you, Chair Powell, Regent Kenya. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um, President, uh, let me, if, sorry, Regent Kenyanya, uh, Dr. Quick is about to save me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Chair Powell, if, if, if I may. Throw her a lifeline. Um, <laughs> um, Regent Kenyanya, I think, uh, unfortunately, the, the, the bundling of these materials in your packet may have been um, slightly misleading. So it may have looked as if the um, campus-wide safety goal report that I believe was prepared by Vice President Franz, uh, it was attached to the end of the MSAFE implementation report as if it were part of it, it is not. Um, indeed, the, uh, the scope of the implementation committee was to look specifically at Dr. Alexander's recommendations for the Twin Cities campus. And that was actually a separate document. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, yeah. that, that I was misled and Madam President, you, you were indeed saved. So thank you. All right, yes. thank you. She, well, she look, does that. <laughs> I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Quick and Dr. White for, for uh, the report today, for the update. Uh, and I will stress that it, it is an update. This is a work in progress. We understand that. Thank, I think all my colleagues for the good questions and comments. This is extremely difficult uh, work. Uh, the discussion, I think, was, uh, was uh, very, very helpful today, and we look forward to uh, hearing uh, from you again as the, as the work continues. So thank you very much. Thank we'll you. turn now to the report of the committees. Uh, we'll begin with the report of the Audit and Compliance Committee. Regent Kenyanya, please, can you share your report? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll admit I was unprepared. Um, the Audit and Compliance Committee did not consider any action items this month, but we had several discussion items in our meeting yesterday. Most importantly, we welcomed Chief Auditor uh, Galswick to his first meeting of the Audit and Compliance Committee. Our first two discussion items focused on our external audit activities. The engagement team from Deloitte, who serves as our external auditor, provided their final summary of the past year's audit work. We were pleased to once again receive no findings across their portfolio of audits and examinations. The committee also reviewed the external audit plan for fiscal year 2021. This plan sets forth the audit scope object objectives and approach the auditors will use. Members from the Deloitte engagement team shared the plan and discussed their assessment of audit risks, testing approach and timeline for the audit activities. That work will get underway this spring. 
We also had a discussion on academic and research misconduct processes. Um, the uh, Chief Auditor Galswick assembled a team with representatives from EOAA, um, research, conflict resolution, con conflict resolution, and uh, compliance. In our final item, Chief Auditor Galswick provided the committee with a brief internal audit update, reporting that 32% of recommendations rated as essential were implemented. Although this number is slightly lower than the 40% expected rate, almost two thirds of the unresolved recommendations are from audits in their first review period. So a lower rate can be expected. The committee will continue to monitor this progress nonetheless. Thank you, Chair Powell. This concludes my report. Thank you, uh, Regent Kenyanya. Regent Hitch, will you please report on behalf of the Litigation Review Committee? Uh, thank you, Chair Powell. The Litigation Review Committee met yesterday at this meeting, we adopted a resolution that authorized the closing of the meeting to discuss matters subject to the attorney-client privilege. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Regent Hipsch. Let's move now to the Mission Fulfillment Committee. Regent Davenport, please, will you offer your report? Thank you, Chair Powell. The Mission Fulfillment Committee had one action item this month. The committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the consent report, which includes requests for approval of new academic programs, requests for approval of changed academic programs, and requests for conferral of tenure for outside hires. All right. So the bo full board needs to uh, consider this. Would any regent wish to separate an item recommended by the committee from the motion? All right, seeing none, any questions or comments? I move to approve the committee consent report. All right, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Any opposed? Aye. All right, that motion carries. Regent Davenport, any additional committee business? That concludes my report, thank you. All right, thank you. Moving on to the report of the Finance and Operations Committee. Uh, Regent Mayron, please would you provide your report? Thank you. The report of the Finance and Operations Committee includes six items this month. First, I'll move those items that were unanimously recommended by the committee for approval by the board. Those items include the following, the resolution related to the issuance of a century bond, the labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5 Health Care and Nonprofessional Unit Local 3260, the labor agreement with AFSCME Council 5, Clerical and Office Support Unit Locals 3800 and 3801, the labor <clears throat> excuse me, agreement with AFSCME Council 5, Technical Unit Locals 3937 and 3801, and the remaining items in the consent report, which includes three purchases of goods and services $1 million and over, the employment agreement and appointment of Robert Stein as Dean of the College of Continuing and Professional Education, Professional Studies, Twin City Campus, and off-cycle tuition changes. All right, uh, so thank you, Regent Mayron. So those uh, six uh, uh, resolutions were unanimously supported by the board. Are there any uh, comments that anyone would like to make on any of those? All right, hearing and seeing none, uh, I'll ask for a vote on those. All those in favor of those um, uh, Do you want six me to move on? Do you want me yes, to Yes, please. Yes, you can first? move them, Regent Mayron. <laughs> I move approval of those items. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. That motion is approved. Regent Mayron. Thank you, Chair Powell. The committee voted to recommend approval of the amended employment agreement for Mark Coyle as director of the Intercollegiate Athletics for the Twin Cities campus. I move approval of the amended employment agreement. Is there a second? I'll second. All right, there's a second. Any uh, questions or comments on uh, that resolution? Uh, Chair Powell. <laughs> yes. Just uh, 20 seconds of comments um, to clean up my um, my uh, governance process from yesterday. I just wanted to thank Regents Kenyanya and Rosha um, for their very thoughtful comments, analysis, comments and analysis um, during this agenda item yesterday. I'm looking forward to having future conversations um, as a board about um, particularly um, things that Regent Kenyanya raised. Um, I was remiss to include um, in my uh, pre-written comments from yesterday about um, how I was going to vote on the item. I 
done that twice now, hope to never do it again, um, and have learned my lesson there. Um, so I won't be able to support this today in light of uh, many comments Regent Rocha and Kenyanya made, but thank Athletic Director Coyle for his leadership and wanted to correct that for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, any other uh, comments on that on the resolution? Mr. Chair, we have Regents Kenyanya and Rocha. All right, Regent Kenyanya. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, uh, for the opportunity. I won't reiterate yesterday's comments. Um, I did get a chance to, um, Regent, my friend Regent Swigum, um responded to my comments and I, I, I had to sit and think about it, but I did get a chance to speak with him after, um, but just wanted to you know, reiterate that, um, you know, I think when we discuss uh, you know, matters of public policy and, and you know, our opinions of administrative salary, um, they're not about, they're not personal or about the individual. I, you know, I, I didn't speak about the director at all, um, you know, who I think highly of, um, you know, but I felt that rebuttal was a bit of a straw man in, um, you know, defending that. So I, you know, my position is a public policy one. Um, so, you know, when we have those discussions. Um, I, I don't think we need to make it personal about the individual when the original argument wasn't. Um, and again, I, I had this conversation um, with the Regent Swigum, but wanted to offer it uh, to everyone else as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Regent Kenyanya. Regent Rocha. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, you know, have a couple of questions. I, it's unfortunate this is a, this is a actually a to me anyway a bigger decision than sort of just the contract of it, uh, on its own, and we're all kind of exhausted and we're past the lunch hour and so on. Um, so it's it's unfortunate. I think I've been very consistent on this topic uh, for a, a, a long time, you know, a number of years about. We've never had an opportunity to talk about the, the strategic uh, goals of our intercollegiate athletic department. Um, this is a, you know, over eight million dollar contract that we're talking about here, so it's it's a significant thing. And I've been I've been uh, you know pleased with um, my interaction and in, in working with uh, with uh, Director Coyle. Uh, but I you know I have a, uh, I've, I've asked to have this this discussion in the past. It's narrowly failed. Um, but in this instance, if if you know to propose a this change, I, I would just maybe ask if, if uh, President Gable could give us a, a, a bit of, a, of what our expectations would be. The, 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 the docket was pretty scant as, as far as what our expectations are of the department uh, over this time period. And, and how do we measure whether this you know, most visible of departments is, is successful in terms of, you know, I know over time we continue to subsidize the program. It's uh, you know, not, not part of our basic charter as an institution, but it's a very important part of, of, of our community. Um, so, you know, what, what are the expectations and what are the me measurements that we know that this is a, a good investment for the University of Minnesota? Uh, Regent Rocha, I'm gonna suggest that it, that's a good question. We can, uh, you, you've asked for uh, some, you know, clarity on goals and objectives. And I think we can come back on that uh, at this stage. Uh, now, I think I wanna move forward uh, with, uh, see if there are other comments on this resolution uh, and uh, and then we'll go from there. Mr. Chair, if I, if I may respond to that, I, you know, I, I supported the resolution yesterday and, yes. and you know, again, the challenge is this, this, you know, this came up for, for my knowledge was a week ago. I mean, it was when, when the, just before the docket came out um, and uh, among other things that we had in front of us, didn't really have much of a chance to analyze it or seek that additional information. And I very much want to support the resolution. I just, you know, it would have been very helpful to me to have that opportunity to hear from the president. I understand that, I, you know, I, I, I doubt that I have the capacity to, you know, compel a response, but that's the whole point. I mean, yeah, um, that, that's the challenge that I have is I, I um, feel good about generally about where the, the department is going and how it's being handled. But I really do think it's something that, you know, some, some institutions have a committee specifically focused on intercollegiate athletics that, you know, we obviously haven't had that, but to really understand what we would expect, because this is, it's a substantial investment. And unlike a couple of programs that generate more revenue than, than they cost, the department as a whole continues to be subsidized or comes out of the general, general fund, whether it's tax dollars, tuition dollars, however you want to consider it. That's just, just wanting to, to, do due diligence on behalf of the yeah. folks that we represent. That's why I made the request. Yeah. If President Gable wants to comment on, you know, goals and accomplishments uh, now, uh, I'd be happy to hear those. Uh, I think that the, you know, requesting uh, more detail on those is, uh, it's a good, it's a good request and we should pursue that. 
Um, don't know how far we can get into that now, but if President Gable wants to make a few comments, I welcome those. Thank you, Chair Powell. Regent Rocha, uh, I mean, essentially, I'm going to give an answer in the way that uh, Chair Powell made a statement, which is that in terms of the expectations for AD COIL, those are in the contract, that there is, in fact, an expectation section of the contract. And I would say, with, at the risk of sounding too much like my training, that that speaks for itself. Um, in terms of the department, uh, A.D. Coyle makes a very robust annual presentation to the board. He uh, makes a singularly large and detailed presentation to the board as compared to other members of the team that directly reports to me. Um, it addresses athletic accomplishments, academic accomplishments, and community successes, along with a lot of detail about their budget. If there are particular attributes that we want to suggest to A.D. Coyle that he add or change or target, in those reports, we can discuss that, but um, that that I would expect the expectations to be as described in the contract and in those three areas as he reports every year. Mr. Thank, if you, I could just uh, thank you, President Chair, Gable. If, Mr. Chair, if I could just briefly respond, I, I appreciate that, and and uh, you know, to the extent we'll have an opportunity to have that discussion, I'll be supportive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Regent Rocha. Uh, Mr. Steves, uh, because some of us are virtual and some of us are in the room and the, you know this was a subject of a good discussion, I think we should call a roll uh, on this motion just for clarity. So, would show, so let's move, it's been moved and seconded, let's move to the roll call. On approval of the, the Athletic Director Employment Agreement, Regent Davenport. Yes. Regent Davenport votes yes. Regent Farnsworth. No. Regent Farnsworth votes no. Regent Hipsch. Yes. Regent Hipsch votes yes. Regent Johnson. Yes. Regent Johnson votes yes. Regent Kenyanya. No. Regent Kenyanya votes no. Regent Mayron. Yes. Regent Mayron votes yes. Regent McMillan. Yes. Regent McMillan votes yes. Regent Rocha. Yes. Regent Rocha votes yes. Regent Swigum. Yes. Regent Swigum votes yes. Regent uh, Tawi Rabe uh, had to leave the meeting early. Uh, Regent Verhalen. Yes. Regent Verhalen votes yes. Chair Powell. Yes. Chair Powell votes yes. Mr. Chair, there are nine in favor and two opposed. All right, thank you very much. That motion is approved. Uh, Regent Mayron, other, uh, other uh, points from your report? There are no other action items this month. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. All right, thank you. And, and finally, now the Governance and Policy Committee, Regent Verhalen, your report, please. Thank you, Chair Powell. The report of the Governance and Policy Committee includes two action items this month. First, the committee voted unanimously to recommend approval of the resolution related to changes to board required reports, I move approval of the resolution. Is there a second? Second. Uh, any additional comments uh, on uh, those changes? Okay, hearing or seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, that motion is approved. Uh, Regent Verhalen? Thank you, Chair Powell. The committee voted to recommend adoption of the proposed amendments to Board of Regents policy namings as presented by President Gable. I move adoption of the proposed amendments as presented by President Gable. All right, is there a second? Second. Second. Are there any additional comments or discussion on uh, the Board of Regents policy on namings? All right, hearing or, and seeing none. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. There was, and just uh, Mr. Steves, if you can help me, there was one no. Yes, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. That motion passes. Thank you. Uh, Regent Verhalen, anything else? There were no other action items this month. Thank you, Chair Powell. That concludes my report. All right, thank you. We'll move on now to old business. Um, is there any old business to come before the board? All right, any new business? Okay, hearing none, this meeting of the Board of Regents is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>